Good afternoon everybody, welcome back to Juma. We're in the Savi Sands in South Africa and it's been quite an eventful afternoon. The last 20 minutes or so we've had an almighty cloud burst, uh, but it seems to have passed now, but you can still see some rather grey ominous clouds on the horizon and there are still some rumbles of thunder around, but it seems that the rain has abated for now at least, but it was some lovely warm tropical rain as well, some cold rain for a change, which is very nice. But my name is Ben and on camera I have got Odie with me again and we are out on Rooster and of course it is now day four, four of the 12 days of Christmas, I think. I'm losing track, which means it's bingo afternoon again with a Christmas theme. Oh, Odie, I was going to show them my board. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bring it. Okay, so in case any of you haven't played bingo before, we have all in all our locations got these boards so this would normally be attached to my dashboard but it started raining and my beautiful pink tape refuses to stick anymore so this will be handheld today uh, so we need to find five in a row be it columns or uh, rows or diagonals and of course we need you in order to verify what we see please obviously we will be probably stretching a little bit some of the interpretations of what these animals may or may not be doing but we will leave it up to your discretion as to whether or not you're feeling generous um, but it is also a live and interactive drive this afternoon, so please do send in your send in your questions and your comments, and we would love to hear from you and answer any queries that you might have about the natural world or us or anything else that happens to be on your mind. But we are up around Sandy Patch, just enjoying some of the vistas over here. There was a few flashes of lightning in that patch of grey cloud over there earlier, but I think the worst of it has passed us, thankfully. But the rest of my plan is there was reports of a leopard somewhere close to Gary Gate this morning coming towards Juma. May well have been Tabungumi going back into Pulpasok, but I thought we'd better go and have a quick look. And then other than that, it's a question of trying to tick off as many things as possible. If my stickers stick on my bingo board, that will be another problem. Okay, but while we head off and see if we can uh, start the victory parade early, uh, let's send you over to Chris and Pridelands, who also wants to say good afternoon. Well, it's bingo time. It's bingo time again. Is it the fourth day or the third day? I think the fourth day. Yeah, I'm losing track here. Right. Now, look, I'm going to go out and have some fun. And if you take a look at there, there's our challenge, that weather inbound. My name is Chris. With me on camera ops is still Johan. So, all right. Tactics, it's still quite hot. But we've got some weather building, some really big stuff, and it's making a lot of noise. There's some stuff building in the north, there's some stuff building in the east, there's some stuff building in the south. So I reckon we're going to get some good weather. I'm going to turn this thing off because it's going to irritate me. It is necessary though because we need to communicate with our fellow game drive, game drive uh, operators out here. Right. Gonna go to Leopard Dam, work the northern areas. If weather permits, we'll head down to Ndlovu Dam. But we'll need to keep an eye on the weather. But for now we're good. Do we have a hornbill on our card? I did see a hornbill flying there that looks rather hungry. We do have a hungry hornbill. Let's go hunt him. He's I went I, I saw him, he went to sit there. Let's go find it. We actually have a hungry hornbill. Indeed. Let's go see if we can find him. Because you can almost be assured that if you find a hornbill now, because they're breeding at the moment, so most of the ones that you see at the moment are males, getting food for the females who are very likely in the nests at the moment. Where are you, buddy? There is, there is. He's hungry. Look at him, he's eating. There, in the road. It is a red billed hornbill. He's definitely looking for food. And it's a male, like I said. Ah, oh, he's eating. Or trying to eat. Yep, he's hungry. That's a hungry hornbill. 
That is definitely a hungry Mongol. Where is he? On my cord. Here is one. It's only one. Hmm. Okay. So the easiest way to distinguish between the male and the female, red-billed hornbill. Female, all red beak. Males, the low mandible is a little bit darker, almost like an off-black. In the tree there. He was definitely looking for food, and he was eating. So can we get a confirmation of a hungry hornbill? Darkman lover. Hi there, Darkman lover. It says happy cat today. Well, I'm delighted we could potentially start with the hungry hornbill. If I get confirmation. If not, I'll find another one. Right. Yo, we've got a mixed bag again. I think we can compete very well today. Confirmed. Thank you, everybody. I'm on the board with my hungry hornbill. Right. My stickers actually got a little bit wet with last night's rain. I'll try and make them work. All right, let's go to Leopard Dam. I'm hoping that we might find some giraffe there with ox peckers. We can either hopefully find a giraffe that's goofy, dung beetle on the way. Maybe that herd of buffalo from yesterday. So that line looks promising to me. Leopard's going to be tricky in this weather, but this is not a bad line. I know there's some zebra down at, at Impolop Clearing. But also, this is, the lines are going to be a tricky one. They're not on the property at the moment, as far as we know. I'm going to target this line here. Monkeys at, at HQ. Oh, these lines are right in the middle, so they're messing up that whole diagonal line for me there. Right. For now, my target line is this one. That's my target line. How about that? I think I got a chance. I think I have a chance. Okay, off to Leopard Dam. Go look for some giraffe there. <laughs> it's getting very dark there. There's our hornbill again. So to show you. You can see there that little black on the lower on the lower mandible or the or the lower jaw indicating it's a male. Right. Let's go over to Ben at Juma. See what he's up to. Yeah, good luck, Chris, this afternoon. Well done for your first sticker. I've got a pair of Swainson spur fowls, which I think, unfortunately, are about to disappear from view. Uh, however, that's on my bingo board, but that doesn't matter. Everything out here is worth stopping for, uh, even if it doesn't earn me a sticker. And the male and female, let me just try and shift a little bit so we can watch them. They're moving through the grass, uh, pecking at little arthropods. We've just had a little cloudburst of rain. Uh, so it has brought out a lot of insects as well. Of course, last night we were absolutely inundated with... Uh, mm, they're going to be a bit difficult to see now, aren't they? I think maybe we must continue. I mean, yeah, they've disappeared behind the bushes. No problem, we will carry on. But uh, all the harvested reproductive termites, the alates, were coming out last night in their droves. Uh, so it was like driving through a blizzard on the way back after drives. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens again usually stimulated by rain but I mean looking at this bingo board we had to put the roofs on and things before we came out so I didn't really have time to plan an attack today um, 
I've got quite a few birds on my list, which might be difficult if it's going to continue to stay wet. But scampering terrapins, mobbing drongos, hovering kingfishers, nesting battle ears is going to be a bit of a pain. I'll show you a battle ear, I'm quite confident of that, but a nesting one might be tricky. Dashing in piles of frowning buffalo, well that's fine, that's any buffalo because they're always grumpy. We will have to see how we go, but I'm sure we can find a dung beetle. We've had lots, having not seen very many dung beetles over the last couple of weeks because it was very dry, after the last few days of rain we've been seeing lots and lots again. And of course it was the dung beetle that gave me my great victory uh, a couple of afternoons ago, which I'm very much hoping to repeat today. That's interesting. I don't think we're going to be able to show it to you unless it lands. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got a pair of Amur falcons, which is the first ones that I've seen. There you go. Where are you, are you going to land? I don't know. If it, there's a dead tree behind us that you might land in. Yes, on the top of the dead tree. I don't hope is it going to be too high for you with the roof. No. Let's just see if we can work you an angle there. Hold on. Oh, sorry about the reef, everybody, but there is my first Amur falcon for the year, or for the season. There it is. Uh, I'm not sure if you're still with us, sorry, but uh, if you are, so that is an Amur falcon. And what you're looking at there is the female. You can see the spots on her chest. Uh, the male just has a is more sort of staty grey colour, so there is a bit of dimorphism between the two sexes. So very, very cool. So this is one, oh, there he goes. This is one of our migratory birds. Uh, one of the Palearctic migrants. And uh, they go all the way up into sort of uh, to Asia, if I remember correctly. And uh, yes, that's right. They come through, I think they go all the way to, uh, oh, nicely, nicely done, Owen. Uh, all the way towards sort of China and that sort of area. And then they come back through the subcontinent across India and then into Africa and down south. So we often see them in big flocks, but these are the first ones that I've seen this year. Very, very nice pair of Amur falcons. So you saw the female at least. Okay, well that was an unexpected start. Always something special. Unfortunately, I most definitely don't have an Amur falcon on my board. Uh, but so I want to go up and check that little link road that we've got that runs up to Buffalo Cut Line towards Baobab Dam because we had reports this morning so I'll be leopard crossing into that area. Uh, so likely Tabungumi because that is his sort of normal stomping ground. Uh, however, he does like it up in Buffalo but there's normally plenty of impalas around Sandy Patch. Oh. Hold on a minute, what have we got over there? I'm sure I just saw a dancing zebra. Let's see. He is, I think we're gonna try and get you a closer look. In fact, no, I don't wanna chase them away. Yeah. Yeah, look at that, these zebras, oh, they were dancing so nicely just before I stopped. But uh, I'm sure if one so much as shakes a leg, we can claim that that was a, a dance. Yeah, I think one was moonwalking, if I remember correctly, when we went past. Look at, oh, look at that, he's doing the two-step. It's the four-step, the four in fact. <laughs> it's interpretive dance, that's all. So, I, I, viewers, I'm sure that you would agree with me that that zebra, look at him dance. 
But nice to see some zebra. Actually, we haven't seen very many zebras over the past week or two, but now we've had a bit of rain, the grass will green up again and hopefully they will start moving back into the area. That is a boy that you're looking at there. You can see the very thin black stripe running um, north-south underneath the tail. If that was a female, that would be a much wider black um, patch of skin. The genitalia is black. So from the female, it's far more obvious. Yes, it's, it's, the bobbing of the head whilst they moved, very much walking like an Egyptian, I would suggest. Well, it's a very wet afternoon out here at Juma, as you can see. The woodland kingfisher is also not really enjoying itself uh, uh, this afternoon, but I think it is singing the praises that the rain has finally passed as it shakes off all of the water. And now you can hear actually there's two of them communicating with one another right now. Oh, there are th four woodland kingfishers that I just saw in total. But off they kind of go. And I don't know if we're out of the woods. You might be able to hear the thunder echoing just in front of us. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Igor. And like I said, we're bumbling around on Juma for this afternoon's bingo drive. Now I've never played a game of safari bingo in my life. However, I have played a couple of bingo games and let me tell you, I am quite competitive and um, was not a favorite when I'd go and play at some of the retirement communities because I'd, you know, kind of go in and clean up. No, I'm just joking. But anyways, uh, so we've got a couple of things uh, on the board this afternoon. One of them is a, a hovering kingfisher. Unfortunately, we're not going to find that with a woodland kingfisher. If we want a hovering kingfisher, we're going to have to look for a pied kingfisher. So we will give it a bash this afternoon. I haven't really uh, checked out all the dams and that type of thing, um, so I'm not sure where the pied kingfishers are hanging around. We'll have to go and figure it out. Maybe a chitwa. Chitwa might be a good example, so perhaps we'll head on in that direction. But anyways, we've got lots of other things on the board, and uh, yeah, we'll try. And now I'm sure you're all wondering about this. It's fashionable, right? Don't you think? So it comes in lots of different colors, small, medium, and large, depending on the size. You could even turn it into a dress. Um, but this afternoon, we got completely soaked. Everything is wet. Like my rain jacket is not really a rain jacket anymore. I could probably use it as a water bottle. It's holding so much water. So I thought I'd just put this on for now in case we get another sudden downpour, um, which I think we might. I'm gonna just show you quickly through the trees. I don't know, can you see the rain? It's quite dramatic, um, there's quite a nice line. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately what just happened is our monitor got soaked with all the water that was sitting on top of the roof and as we slowed down it sort of waterfalled onto it so we need to just let it dry out so we've switched it off. But that is another cloud burst coming in and I, it's kind of looks like it, I'm trying to see which way the, the clouds are moving but it's proving to be quite difficult. I think it might be going a little bit south, so we'll keep an eye on that because there's also lots of lightning. And we don't want to be struck. It's a pity there isn't anything about rain on this board. But um, a couple of insects and frogs, uh, which I don't think will be too difficult to find this afternoon with the, with the downpour, and we might have had a few of them come out. Fiona, thank you very much for saying that you have my back and that you think I might win today. I know I'm off to a slow start, but uh, we'll get there, I promise. I think that's exactly what we're going to do. I think we'll just head towards Chitwa, go check out the dam, because I think we can probably tick off Kingfisher. Maybe we'll find a foam nest frog along the way. We'll have to see if we'll I'll see if I can figure that one out. Um, Baboons, maybe, down that side? I think a daring dung beetle. We had one of those this morning, actually. Perhaps we need to go find it again. Maybe it's still being attacked by the ants. Well, hopefully not. Um, so, yeah, so we will we'll go, and, we'll go and see. Dancing zebra. We had, did have, we, sure, we had a lot of these this morning. Anyways, we will see. And uh, hopefully try our, our best. 
that's all we can do, hey? I know I was pretty, pretty confident there, but I'm really just teasing. I also don't mind if I don't win. So Chris, of course, is playing the game and he's had a few more runs of this than I have. I wonder how many stickers he's got on his board. Okay, we're live. Hi there, everybody. My apologies. I think we have lost our communication since uh, we're looking straight at Marib's cop here. You cannot even see it. You cannot even see the mountains. It is covered in rain. And just take a look at it. We're going to be heading away from this area very soon. There's lightning approaching. There's actually some lightning very close to us now. So for safety reasons, we're probably going to try and see if we can't head further for the east, it looks a slight bit. Oh, this now this cloud system above us. You can see cells building right above us. That little cloud's very, very, very purple. So there's some lightning that's starting to and that's a sudden temperature drop from this inferno that we had today. Like really one of the hottest days we've had so far. You can clearly feel this, this and it's typically off of supercell approaching. So hopefully that will bring some much needed rain. Even though we had a couple of storms the last two days, we need more. Right. Okay, right, we're going to try and get a little bit further east. This system is right above us now. And let's go and see what Taylor is up to. Now I really need the support from all of you here. We're looking at a very sticky mass and uh, basically the overducal secretion from the female foam nest frog um, with the help of the males churning it up into that wonderful ball of what looks like cotton candy but don't eat it. Now on my bingo board, I have something that says fidgety frog. And most of you who have been watching over the years, you have seen us talk. We've, we've watched leopards eating foam nest frog. We've, you know, we've seen it all. But those tadpoles that are inside there, I suspect that they probably already, really hatched and, um, you know, really starting to, to kind of develop now and they're getting heavier and heavier. So technically they're obviously a frog, um, just, well, very young and they haven't quite metamorphosized into adults, but they're definitely fidgeting around in, inside that, um, that sort of sticky mass. So I don't know if that counts as a fidgety frog. I don't know if we're allowed to use different life stages of animals, if that still counts. I suspect it might, but um, I suppose you can all let me know and then we might add a sticker. We're obviously looking for a, uh, a foamless frog that was much closer, but we'll take what we can get this afternoon. You know, like I said, we'll just start off slow. Start, like, you know, but easy, easing into it. I want to give the others a bit of a chance, you know. Um, because once we get going, there is no stopping us. I say this and I'm probably going to come stone last now. Is there a punishment? Um, there is a hornbill also just sitting uh, up into the back of the where the foam nest frog is. I don't know if you can see it on the dead tree there. You can also see maybe see a bit of the rain. I don't really have anything about a hornbill, sadly, on my, um, on my board today. But anyways, also, every, all the birds, it's actually actually a really good opportunity to do some birding because everything is going to be sitting out in the open trying to, to dry off. You can, you can hear them. They just haven't stopped chirping. Woo! 
Yes. Yay. Fidgeting frogs. Oh man, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for being on my side. <laughs> now, we haven't got stickers today. We have got a neon green because why not? Why not be a little bit? Um, camera tape. Um, do we only sh do one? Or do you tick all, do you put no, stick? So can I do this again? You gotta be strategic about where you put it. No, don't say things like that. Okay, now I've got to, uh, now I've got to choose wisely. This is very stressful. No one told me how stressful this, this was actually gonna be. <whistles> right, what do you think, Igor? Left or right? Darting Daker, ooh, there's a chance. Shy elephant. Um, yo, I don't know. Okay, I think yeah. we're gonna this one. We're gonna go on the left hand side and we're gonna do that fidgeting frog. There we go. We've got squares, not circles, as well, because we like to be different. And I, I do fit in a box. No, I don't. I don't fit in a box. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm gonna carry on driving now. Let's see what else we can find. Maybe. There'll be a dung beetle, a daring dung beetle. Any dung beetle on the road while I'm driving is daring. So, because there's always a risk that, uh, you know, there could be an accident for the dung beetle. So we'll try, we'll try not to have any of those kinds of accidents today. But I think we need to keep moving. This might be a good area this evening to come and check for chameleons. Come and scan around here because I've got climbing chameleons uh, on the board. That won't be a difficult one. What happens when there's a chameleon walking across the road, though? I feel like that's actually a bonus, and then I can choose two, no? Because it's rarer to see a chameleon on the road than it is to see one on the tree. That's just my opinion anyways. You don't have to listen to it. What have you seen? Ah, okay. Let's see if we can get a view. I think we might be able to squeeze a view just between these glory bushes. Hang on. <laughs> no. Back. And swing a little bit. Well, not really. Is that good? We're still waiting for our monitor to dry. I'm probably going to... I don't know if I've got anything clean or dry with me that I can just wipe everything down. But there we have three bateliers sitting in a tree. W-A-T... C-H-I-N-G, they're watching something. They both, all of them look like adults, in fact, which is very nice, lovely. I've always, we've always had the most interesting batelier sightings on Juma, and I don't really know why, and I can't remember if I've ever asked one of my, my bird nerd friends about why we see so many bateliers together, because we've seen a bunch of adults and juveniles all sitting in the same tree on Drakensberg Road. Maybe some of you remember from many years ago, on Drakensberg Road, we, there was one dead tree that we'd always see them sitting in. Um, yeah, interesting. But uh, we've obviously all seen Stranger Things happening but they typically do pair up for life so I don't know if it's a, a juvenile that has now reached adulthood and not ready to move on just yet it, it's obviously quite difficult to tell so we can really just surmise as to what's um, what's going on but sadly nothing about battle years we've got all sorts of sure this is a tricky one tricky a lizard a Slytherin Hmm, okay. We'll have to just check on the branches if we want to find a lizard. On the twelve days of Christmas, Wild Earth has planned to see Twelve hippos hiding, eleven weavers weaving, ten leopards leaping, nine ostrich dancing, Eight liner lying, seven Ellie swimming, six cheetah chasing, five buffalo, four calling cubs, three giraffes, two crocodiles, and a naughty vervet monkey.
Sorry for the post, everybody, but look, those in parlour are definitely dashing across the road. Uh, we will go back and show you some more static in parlours in a moment, but uh, we needed a dashing in parlour, so sorry for the post, but that is protecting us from impending rain. There's quite a few of them up there, and I've, there are a couple of rather peckish-looking oxpeckers in the tree above them, but I think we're going to struggle with the roof to show you, so I'm just going to move the car forward slightly so we can get a little closer to these Impala, which have dashed, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, across the road, and hopefully we will find one of these peckish oxpeckers uh, once we get a better view. And there's a crested frank across it. And we do have a, a very dashing wildebeest as well. Uh, but he is no help on my bingo board. But I'm sure if we care... Oh, I saw a dung beetle. Oh, it needs to be rolling a ball, according to my uh, bingo board. Right. Oh, let's find a, a peckish oxpecker. There we go. Have you got one? A peckish look? Or uh, Where is he? Where is he? No, that's an ear. <laughs> Good try. He's got slightly wonky horns, that one. Shame. Oh, where's a peckish oxpecker when you need one? There are some oxpeckers. There were some sitting in the tree, and I can hear. Let's move forward a bit, see if we can open up more of the herd. But hopefully, viewers, you will agree that that is indeed a dashing impala. And we just must quickly find us a pecking oxpecker. A pecking oxpecker? A peckish oxpecker. Excellent confirmation for Dashing and Parlour. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. We're going to quietly steal this afternoon. I wouldn't say I'm confident about my board, but um, depending on how things go, I think we've definitely got a chance. OK, there must be an oxpecker in amongst this lot. those vocalizations those, those are the females talking to their lambs oh look at those two grooming at the front oh, and grooming their faces and they're just looking at us now i can see lots of dung dung beetle hovering around but i need a rolling dung beetle but surely there's a peckish oxpecker in there somewhere how are we not seeing a peckish oxpecker Oh, we've got one drinking there at the front, Eddie. Afternoon, Nancy. Um, they need a little bit of time, but it doesn't take long. I honestly can't tell you exactly how long it is, but we're talking, you know, in the first within half an hour or so. Uh, then they'll be up and around. It's what we call these precocial youngsters. Uh, which means they have to be able to move quickly, otherwise they will be picked off. It's a hard enough time already, as is. Uh, so they can stand very, very quickly after birth. I believe the quickest standing, if that's the right phrase for it, uh, is actually the wildebeest, uh, probably born of their more sort of migratory tendencies. Not that we have migratory wildebeest in this area, but of course everybody knows uh, the great migration in East Africa. So wildebeest are the most precocial of all the species out here, but impalas are not far behind. I've still got a, the, every now and again you might hear a snort. That's the male leading these females. So as you're doing some breeding, trying to figure out this whole impala thing, because it's very confusing, this whole idea of territoriality. It seems that... Impalas are considered to be territorial all the time, but only if they're actually holding a territory and they exhibit far more territorial behaviour during the rut. So that male who's just wandered through shot potentially is sort of holding this territory and he's maybe being sort of inspired to be a little bit territorial by herding his females. Because they're around, it's probably stimulated some um, sort of genetic behaviour uh, that he's got. Because normally you only see an increase in that territorial behaviour during the breeding season, during, well, sorry, during the, the rutting season, we should say, when the males establish those what are normally considered to be seasonal territories. We got a dung beetle. Is it rolling a ball? We need a bowl, a ball rolling dung beetle. Specific. It's quite specific. 
I can't believe we didn't find an ox pecker. There's like a hundred impalas in there. But I could at least put a sticker on my dashing impala. And if we can find a peckish ox pecker, that actually gives us three in a row. Quite a strong start. What have you got? Oh. You've got a, is it rolling anything? Oh, it is. Look, it's rolling. Zoom in. Yes. Oh, there we go. Look, in fact, look at that. Two dung beetles are rolling. Yeah, I think we should get extra points. So we get one sticker and a, another sticker of our choice for overachieving. Two. Have you got a third one rolling there? But uh, I'm sure, viewers, you would all agree that that is a, what is the official terminology? Yes, a dung, a dung beetle rolling. And there we go. Lots of dung beetles. Uh, Judy, sorry, I did hear, uh, I think, a question coming through. I was far too excited uh, with my dung beetle rollings, or rolling dung beetles. I didn't catch it. Patricia, you're asking about Impala's sense of smell. Um, they have a decent sense of smell, not as good as some of the other animals out here, certainly. A rhino, elephant, um, obviously the predators all have very good sense of smell. But certainly Impalas do have a good sense of smell, far better than ours. Uh, but not as good as others. It's very difficult for me to sort of quantify it. Uh, but for example, you can see if there was a pride of lions here and the wind was blowing from the lions to the Impala, uh, you would notice a, a definite change in the behaviour of the impala. They would be aware that something is up and that they could smell a predator. And obviously that's how they do their social bonding as well. Uh, mothers and lambs will bond through scent. Uh, so yes, they do, but not to the extent of some other animals out here. I hope that answers your question, Patricia. Uh, and I think we should do a board update because if we can find this pesky peckish ox pecker, uh, then we're not doing too badly actually. We've had quite a strong. So I've preemptively uh, stuck my dung beetle on. So my apologies. I've just have received confirmation. I jumped the gun a little bit, but that's good. So dung beetle rolling, dancing zebra dashing parlor. If we can get a peckish ox pecker, we've got three in a row already. And then we just need a trotting warthog and a nesting battalier. What else do we, if we go with the dung beetle, or do we need a kingfisher, waterbuck, darting dragonflies? That's doable. But it's a strong start. It's a strong start, Odie. All right, I think let's carry on. There's some more impalas in front. Maybe we can find that peckish oxpecker up there. But nice to see the dung beetles back again. Everything's just stimulated by the rain we've had over the last couple of days. There are still some fairly ominous rumbles of thunder around us. But so far, Juma has remained clear. So apart from about a 10 minute cloud burst just before we came out, which soaked everything and everybody. Okay, lots of dashing young male impalas here. Do any of them have a peckish ox pecker? Oh, and there is a gnu. A shy gnu. I haven't seen any gnus or wildebeests mentioned on any of the bingo boards that we've had yet. So uh, I sympathise with you, Mr. Gnu. It's not that we don't like you. They're not unusual to see a territorial male wildebeest hanging out with a group of impala. It's just more eyes and more ears. He hasn't been able to attract any females to his area, obviously. In fact, I haven't seen a little group of female wildebeest for a very long time. I think most of them have migrated a little bit further north to that shorter grass around the Manuleti. What I did just see in the distance, though, was a red-crested Koran doing its display. I just saw one pop up above the tree line, tuck his wings in and drop down again. So it's amazing. We haven't seen that for weeks. It's amazing that we're in breeding season. So 
So all these young impalas we can see look like from last year. You can see those straight horns. That's normally a sign for about a yearling. So straight horns for a year, kind of meeting in the middle, almost like a heart shape is about two years. And then three years and above is fully grown with beautiful sort of step in the horn. These are obviously particularly clean impala though. Or oh, none of our oxpeckers are peckish today. Okay, I think we're going to continue on our search. Uh, no sign of anything around Sandy Patch in terms of tracks, or even if they were there, they may have been washed away by that little storm we had. Uh, but I shall check around Aubrey's and then try and plan a route to tick off as many stickers as possible. Good luck, Ben. We've got some giraffes, some zebras, and those two grey blotches in the back. Those are two beautiful elephant bulls approaching. How stunning is this? They did come to visit us already today, these two. Well, I suspect it's these two. They left in exactly that direction as well and now they are coming from it so i assume it's them but i'll only be able to confirm that once they are close enough to us but there's definitely something interesting that is catching the attention of these giraffes i just want to have a look see i'll get back to our elephants now as soon as they come closer Apparently one of our directors, Jarrett, did see two lions here early this morning, but we have not seen anything today. And of course the other animals are super chilled, so I don't think it's anything serious. And these massive black flocks that you see fluttering around, those are the red-billed quilias. They truly are magnificent. We've seen beautiful scenes with them today you know just at one stage it was such a large flock that they actually chased the wildebeests away from the water which i never have seen so that was pretty amazing just want to have a look because all of the animals are now looking in this direction hmm. let us have a look see say nothing that I see yet but of course you know our knowledge and interpretation only goes as far as the dam cam we don't smell what they smell we don't hear what they hear so perhaps there might be something around that uh, could potentially come to say hello oh hi unicorn how special we've now got Two elephant bulls approaching from the complete other side, of course. And then a beautiful black rhino. I was waiting for you to come say hello.
So this is in fact our first rhino sighting for the day here in Okokoyo. Generally from what we see, you know, this is for the most part the time that they come around to the water hole. However, that being said, anything can influence them. The weather, the temperature, really anything. We don't know what happened with them before they came here. You know, they have perhaps a tiff with someone <laughs> that left them thirsty. That they have a lot to eat. Perhaps some food with a lot of tannins. Of course, black rhinos are browsers, so they feed on leaves. And they too can, you know, sometimes get that tannin taste that trees will produce from getting overbrowsed. So, don't know. Maybe it's just time to come to the water hole, the rhino decided. So, I'm just going to try and give us a wider look just so that we can also see when the elephants are arriving. White Mane, good afternoon. You would like to know if there's anything for the Koliyas to feed on. That's a brilliant question because when you look at Ukokoyo in itself, <laughs> and I often say this, I, I don't care if I was a bird or a rhino or an elephant or a lion, I don't know if I'd w I would want to live here. I would rather live in a place like Juma, for instance. But of course, you know, when these animals come into the world, they don't get asked where would you like to go. <laughs> So, um, yes, no, definitely. The quillias are seed eaters. So, there is luckily a lot of food. Alright, so our Ellie's are on the way. Let me just do this, just so that we can see when the quillias come and go. But it's really remarkable how they can just, you know, in perfect unison, take off and fly away again and come to the water. And believe it or not, in that split second all of them get a drink so the reason they fly like that as well is of course for safety numbers because if you look at a red bull quillia it's a tiny bird it's not very intimidating or impressive in terms of its size but you had to see some of the scenes we had here today in Okokoyo it was literally this massive black swarm that just took off came to the water and literally like a good 20 wildebeest just ran off they were like nope we're out <laughs> we are not here for this so it truly is a magnificent bird all righty well i'm going to continue monitoring the beautiful damn cameras and in the meantime i'm going to send you to ben so we can see what he's up to with his bingo board thank you lisa well we've got a very very handsome young batelier sitting in a dead tree here uh, I'm sure he'll show his face. There we go. You can see that characteristic sort of bluish green uh, color to the sear and the beak and that sort of uh, facial markings. And you can see those wingtips sticking out from underneath him there and the absence of a tail, which of course is the most characteristic thing about the Batelier. And in fact, its new name is a short-tailed snake eagle. But as I think we always say, a little bit like the acacias that are no longer acacias, I think this will, for most of us, remain a batelier for life. Uh, which is an old French word named by a Monsieur Le Veillon. Oh, I thought that might have been a mobbing drongo for a moment, but it's a starling. I need a mobbing drongo. Um, Mr. Monsieur Le Veillon, who was a French naturalist who named a few birds over here, like Le Veillon's cuckoo, Le Veillon's cesticula. And for some reason, he decided to name this one instead of a Levance eagle of some description. He went with the term batteleur, which stems from an old French word meaning acrobat or tightrope walker. Because of those, or the lack of a tail, they're not very stable in flight. 
and they tend to sort of wobble around and it's supposed to look like somebody walking across a tight rope like in a circus. Oh, was that a was that a drongo or is that another starling? Uh, it's a starling. I don't think I've ever been so hopeful to watch a, a raptor get mobbed. <laughs> a shame we had that uh, beautiful Wahlbergs yesterday afternoon getting mobbed. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so they wobble in flight. So that is the origin of the name Batalure. Now, in terms of the bingo board, I should point out that I have developed a, a bit of dyslexia this morning. Um, so, Odie, just perhaps you could justify uh, this one for me. So, I I, have, I do have dyslexia. So, I'm, I see here that I need to get a nestling batelier, um, and that is very much juvenile batelier. Uh, or possibly it has come from a nest, uh, so it's a denested batelier. I leave it up to our wonderful audience to decide whether or not um, they feel that that's worthy of a sticker. You've got to try. Uh, Julie, again, I was far too busy trying some inane justifications to put stickers on my board that I completely missed that question. <laughs> Would you mind repeating it for me again, please? It's your guys' fault for making us all competitive. Oh, Jessica, that's not an easy question. Um, if I'm honest, I will have to go and check for you what the... Uh, oh, anyone copy me on Juma? Sorry, let me turn that down. Uh, what the average weight is of a Basile. If we were to weigh this one right now, he probably would be a little heavier than normal because he's going to be a little bit waterlogged, I'm afraid, because we did have that uh, little bit of a downpour. Um, I will endeavour to check for you, Jessica, but I would think I'm going to have a sort of a stab in the dark while I try and find out. Um, what do you reckon, Odie? Maybe two kgs? Perhaps? Is that a bit much? Three k? I don't know. Hovering, I'm going to hover around the two kg mark, but I will let you know momentarily and see how horrible my guess was. Hey, 2.25 kgs, according to some literature I just checked. So I think that's a pretty good guess. Who needs? This is a nestling one. That, that's exactly, as Eddie just pointed out, this is a nestling um, or a denested batelier, so possibly it is in fact two kilograms. So, more bonus points. Can see the way he's sitting. <laughs> he's practicing nesting for when the time comes. That's exactly how he would sit on a nest. I believe that for, in fact, I feel a little bit. Uh, like we've cheated the system there, but thank you for confirming our batelier. It's going rather well, that gives us three in a row. And if we can find a peckish oxpecker, which shouldn't be too difficult, then we may achieve bingo. That's the plan. Can you see my bingo shirt? My lucky safari t-shirt there. And a trotting warthog, that's going to be the problem. We don't see that many warthogs, but I did get some around in Parlour Plains the other day, so we might check. Uh, but thank you very much for the questions. Uh, we do enjoy your questions. It's, uh, it's so great to hear from you and know that we are interacting with you live. Please do keep sending them in. Thank you, Yolanda. Yes, um, I think we are in a bit of a roll. We've had a very strong start, certainly. Uh, and long may it continue. I would like to build on my individual victory at the moment. That's... Uh, Hey, you know, you really do well. You win once, it could have been a fluke, but if we win repeatedly, then I think uh, we've justified our position at the top of the leaderboard. Look at those incredible cloud formations behind as well. There's some very exciting clouds around today. I'm just keeping an eye on the weather, but I think we're okay for now. Okay, I think we're going to continue on. I need to maybe I might go back down to quarantine. Uh, we occasionally do get warthogs there, and I'm sure with all the impalas running around, we might find uh, a peckish oxpecker down there as well. This is unbelievable! Unbelievable! Join me, James Hendry, on an odyssey through the most adorable. Fascinating, heart-stopping moments that we have experienced here on Wild Earth.
welcome. If you have only just joined us, we are in the beautiful Okokweo and we've got two beautiful elephant bulls as well as a black rhino. And these are two frequent visitors to this water hole. The one actually has no hair on its tail. They've got very remarkable tusks. It's two fairly older bulls. But we get to spend quite some time with them here at Ukukweo. Not every single day, but as I say, this is at least the second time we are seeing them today. So, yes. Margaret, you would like to know what is the largest recorded elephant now to my knowledge and again you you might have different information to my knowledge personally it was an elephant that weighed 6.8 tons and uh, it was actually a tusker from kruger and if i'm not mistaken i think he was aged at 86 years old i could be wrong i think it was 86 years old but um, of course, you know, when you look at elephants specifically, it becomes very, very interesting when you start studying them from different regions to different reserves and parks. I'm sure those of you that have been to Kruger National Park, for instance, the elephants there are huge. They've got massive tusks. But that being said, if you start analyzing, you know, the different genetics and you start looking at the younger elephants, their tusks are thinner, their tusks are smaller and their bodies are also smaller. So how I always like to refer to it is as the fish tank effect. And again, you know, this is not always going to be the rule of thumb. But if you think about a fish tank, you've got a little fishy or big fishy, whatever the case is, <laughs> the smaller your fish tank is, and the more fish you've got in there, the smaller your fish is going to stay. Because now it's got competition and it also doesn't have a lot of space and a lot of food. So therefore it's based on genetic wealth. So that fish will only become that big. If you've got this huge fish tank with, you know, just one fish in, that fish is going to become really huge. And um, I'm not saying abnormally huge, you know, with regards to the species but definitely something to look at when you start analyzing elephants and the different genetic lines you see that's why a lot of the old elephants in kruger are still very 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 big because they still have those blood lines giraffes have left all righty that's fine i will continue to watch the beautiful elephants walking off and our black rhino hopefully sticking around and while i do so i'm going to send you back to ben so we can see what he is up to with that bingo board Thank you, Lisa. I'm rather jealous of your elephants. I haven't seen an elephant for a couple of drives, and they are some of my favourite things to watch. So I'm hoping we find some this afternoon. I do need a trumpeting elephant, uh, and I also need a kudu and nibbling. But I believe we were somewhat tenuously given our nesting battalier, so thank you very much, viewers. That was rather generous, and I'm feeling a little bit guilty about it, so... We will wait and hopefully this kudu will genuinely nibble on some vegetation, being a browser that she is. And I don't know if you would agree, but her little uh, cappuccino moustache there looks particularly vibrant this afternoon. And I think she's somewhat pregnant as well. She's got quite a big belly there. No offence, my girl. Oh, you're not going to nibble on something for me. Come on. Let's see if we can just move forward. I think the others maybe have crossed. Normally kudus are in uh, little groups of females of around about sort of four, five, six. Possibly some youngsters in tow. And then the males tend to be in for bachelor groups. If you see a big 
beautiful spiral horned male with the females then chances are one of the females is an estrus otherwise the males generally don't associate with the, uh, the breeding herds oh you're right here girlie sorry i didn't see you there that's going to be right behind the pole for you is it i think you're good i guess you're further back in rooster but she does look highly pregnant i wonder and i'm just wondering i don't see any others here where this perhaps she has gone off on her own maybe there is a kudu calf imminent who knows But you never know with the kudu. There may well be others here, but they, when they stand still like that and just freeze, that is their defense mechanism, they just disappear uh, into the bushes. So it's quite normal to see one and then realize you're surrounded by them. But until they move, you just don't see them. I get the feeling we're being watched. And a great big radar dish ears pointing towards us. Oh, she's very pregnant, eh? I wouldn't be surprised if she has uh, disappeared from the rest of the group and is maybe... Oh, I think that's a nibble, everybody. I think you would agree that is a kudu and nibbling. Afternoon, Sam. Uh, thanks for the question there. Um, more interesting family dynamics are sort of, it, it's not overly complex in, in kudus. As I said, normally you will have a group of females and their youngsters. Uh, and as far as I know, the young females will associate with the herd. Uh, but obviously there'll be some migration. <laughs> Look at those white, uh, those cappuccino lines. They're very pronounced today. Her lips quivering. Um, and the males form, say, little bachelor groups, or you might see a male uh, on its own as well. Uh, but I can't really sort of give you any mind-blowing uh, family dynamics of kudus that I can think of. Perhaps an interesting fact with regard to the breeding behaviour. So when a female does come into heat or come into oestrus, uh, she will give off pheromones. It'll be contained in her urine, in her dung. And a male will pick up on that. Uh, we've discussed the behaviour of that Fleming grimace with the organ of Jacobson before. That's how they analyse uh, the scent, that species-specific information, uh, which will give you the uh, sexual status of that animal and lots of other chemical information that we are not privy to. Um, and that will attract a male to the area. The males will sort of... Um, argue with one another and the most dominant male will then arrive at the herd but normally a kudu comes into heat for around about somewhere between five to seven days there or thereabouts but and this is the same for a lot of animals but i know it's definitely been documented in kudus more often than not the female will only actually allow mating to take place on the very last day of her easter cycle um, and we think the reasoning behind that is to ensure that you're most likely to have the most dominant male in the group at that time the best genetics uh, that you're going to get because that's given them five to seven days of smelling the fact that she's in estrus all those males are sort of scuffling with one another uh, and theoretically the biggest and strongest kudu will be the one still standing at the end of her cycle so she'll then only mate around about the last day to ensure that the best genetics get passed on But I do not see any other kudus here, so I would not be surprised if we check around uh, all breeze. That's where we are at the moment. We might find a young kudu in, in the next day or two. I have just received confirmation of our nibbling kudu. Uh, yet another sticker. We are tearing it up this afternoon. A kudu, a nibbling. I have to see if I can stick my board up now it's stopped raining a little bit. So we're doing quite well. I mean, you're trotting water, we're going to peckish uh, ox pecker for this column. This leaves us with a cat, hyena, leopard, and some drongos mobbing. Oops, my head's in the way. 
Uh, Leaping Leopard, my plan is a little bit later this afternoon, we'll swing by Marips unless Taylor uh, heads there. Um, Cackling Hyena, that's going to be not an easy one though. But I'm also going to go past Gary Dam shortly and I'm sure we will find a silent Egyptian goose. Excuse me, everybody. I just need to give an update on the radio. Uh, afternoon, uh, no updates as of yet. Copy that. Uh, you know the last look of uh, Black Dams? Uh, about three hours this morning. Uh, yeah, if, um, I, somewhere around the inflow of Treehouse Dam, um, but I'm not sure if they're still there. I don't think, I think the last time, or the lock was left at around about nine o'clock, I think. I've never seen, an, sorry, I'm back now, I'm just updating people on the radio, but I've never seen out here an animal giving birth. I've been doing this for a long time, but never actually been present for a birth. So that would be pretty spectacular. I've, the closest I've got uh, is seeing a freshly lambed impala that was uh, still having the afterbirth cleaned off or the amniotic fluid cleaned off by the mother, but I haven't actually seen it happen. Um, and a, shame, a buffalo that had a breached birth that didn't make it, unfortunately, the cough uh, was positioned incorrectly um, and uh, it had to be removed, that one, I'm afraid. But uh, no, never seen a live birth, so I think I will definitely be coming back to check this area over the next day or two. Well, Ben, as I always say, you know, there's always a first, whether you've been guiding for five minutes, five years, 50 years, there's always going to be something new to experience, whether you're seeing it, smelling it, hearing it. That is the exciting thing about what we do. For instance, today we saw banded monkeys to, for the first time on the Ukukweyo Dam Cam, as well as Irland, which to me was very, very special. So there will always be some sort of new experience, you know, whether you've seen a sighting, you might get to a near reserve and not have seen that sort of sighting or that type of sighting. But how beautiful is this glistening water and the zebras. We actually just as you know, we went over to Ben. <laughs> The one elephant pool and the rhino had a wee bit of a standoff, but it was very brief. The rhino just sort of stood its ground and then the elephant threw a tantrum as they always do and then they just took off. No zebra babies here, sadly. <laughs> Not yet. Hopefully one of these days. Hopefully before the new year is on us. Right, now this is no laughing matter. Unfortunately, this beetle has succumbed to its death and I'm not very excited about it, but I did think it was a, a dung beetle. And unfortunately it is not. It's actually a predatory ground beetle. Um, so it doesn't count. We will find another daring dung beetle. I'm trying to pick it up, but it is also gross. If 
So I'm going to try and I'm going to put it on, probably put it on the ground because I don't know what's. Can I put it on the ground here? Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. And down it goes. So, yeah, it's definitely one of the predatory ground beetles. It's a bit, um, I mean, it's massive. If I put my hand next to it just for like a sort of size comparison, um, you can kind of see it's almost as long as my uh, index finger. Um, now, what's quite interesting, obviously, we know that all insects have got six legs. So it's got the, the three uh, pairs of legs here. But what's really interesting are these huge, I don't know, I'm just trying to see if you can see that sort of an extra appendage over here that it would use to physically grab insects or whatever it might be hunting. Um, presumably they're hunting mainly different types of insects that they will sort of feed on, but they are massive. They kind of look like at first glance um, sort of the front legs of a dung beetle that's got all these little serrate, uh, serrated sort of parts here and then its actual mandibles are further inside but we're unable to see that but it is a very very big creature and there are loads of them that run around at night time quite cool though but not what we are looking for I'm afraid so we'll probably just get in and keep uh, keep going See, it's quite nice. It keeps all the equipment dry. Radio's dry. Mic pack's dry. Looks nice. I can't really wear a dress on safari, so we do something like this. I don't know. I'm joking. I'm being an idiot. Right, let's get in the car. Um, let's go see what other things we can find. We're actually going to make it towards Chitwa Dam, I promise, at some point. Um, we just had to fix a couple of things. Did you hear what what do what 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 did you hear that? Um, sorry. So I, I heard Kenneth. You had a question about something that feeds on something, but I missed those two vital points there. Like I said, sometimes the voices in my head are louder than the directors. Oh, what animals would actually feed on a dung beetle? Birds. Birds love dung beetles. Those hornbills will capture them and bash them about and try and get into the deliciousness because obviously the outside is not very tasty. Lilac breasted rollers, uh, southern ground hornbills like Ben saw this morning. So, so birds, I would say, are the, the biggest uh, threat to a dung beetle. But unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to get the squirrel. It might be hard, but it is actually quite comical. Um, there it is, because firstly it's strange, but it, look at its tail, it's missing most of the hair. It's like it's pretending to be a slender mongoose. Good camouflage. Like a really little slender mongoose, but it isn't. <laughs> Shame. I'm not sure what have caused uh, the loss of hair. I don't know if it was maybe um, mites or maybe it has a fungal infection or something along those lines. But that is unfortunate, quite unusual to see. But slender mongoose obviously much larger in size, but they have a very similar characteristic where they have this long, thin tail, and then of course a little bulge on the top. But let's keep going because we, we really need to play catch up now. We were handed a couple of obstacles, but that's fine. I like a challenge. Um, we managed to get them all sorted out, which is great. And now we need to head on. We also had a Koki, there's the Koki Franklin. Okay, let's have a quick look at it because we actually found one just now, but then it moved away. So we've got another Koki Franklin. Sorry, of course, we've got the roof on, so you're going to see the bars. Hi, what you doing up there? Look at that. This is, I haven't actually seen a Koki Franklin. I want to say over the last year, I don't think I have seen one. So that's the male sitting up there on top and he's quite vocal declaring to everybody that this space is his and there is a female around here but we won't look at her now because she's just gone behind the the termite mound but what an epic bird to see i always forget that the northern sabi sand actually the sabi sand in general is actually quite good for seeing um the species of bird and i unfortunately haven't spent much time here other than i was briefly at um at Mala Mala at the beginning of the year, just for um, a couple of days. So such a nice bird to, of course, see. Now, this is not a normal call that we, we typically hear. We normally hear it's got sort of a two-syllabled um, call, Koki, Koki. Not today, though. 
not today. But what a lovely scene. I'm sure all the, the keen birders out there will be chuffed with the with this sighting. Pam, thank you. You've said that it's a, an amazing find. I quite like it too. I mean, we, we, you know that I'm not the craziest birder out there, unfortunately. Like, I enjoy looking at them, but, like, I won't spend money to go and travel to seabirds. So um, whenever we can find them um, on our doorstep, really, then I shall appreciate them. I don't keep a bird list anymore either, but I also traveled so many countries, my bird list would be quite ex extensive now. A lilac-breasted roller flying around too. There's so many birds that have just come out. Meow, it's a racing one. So pity we don't have anything that to do with a bird on the bingo board, and especially about one sprinting off. And the female's actually just up in front of it now, crossing the road. Hopefully they get closer together. Oh, hello, you're a bit excited, girl. You can see she doesn't have uh, the... <laughs> the male's going to come out now too, meow, quite quickly disappearing, not liking to be in the open, but you can see there's a vast difference between the male and female coloration. And off they go into the long grass. Short and sweet. I say this and watch him come back out into the open now, we'll be able to watch him for another 10 minutes. Mm, Jeff, no, now you're asking me a question that I'm not 100% sure of. Um, I can't remember how the Cokie Franklin got its name. However, other than the fact that it's probably named after its call. Like I said, not this call specifically, but they obviously birds have more than one call. Uh, there's another another call that they do that I just described, and that kind of sounds like you're saying, Cokie, Cokie, co I mean, every bird has a different rhythm. But you kind of get the gist of it. So, yeah, a lot of birds are named after um, after their calls, just like a, a hoopoo, for example. Whoop, 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 that kind of thing. So I suspect that that's the answer, Jeff. But maybe, who knows? Maybe there was somebody, a, an explorer named Koki that named it that way, or maybe it's got something to do with their... Uh, scientific name. Anyways, we're going to move on from these non-bingo board contenders and go and try and find something on the board. Off you go to Ben and I'm sure he's smashing it out the park this afternoon. Right. Well, we are with these kudu. Many other kudus have arrived. Um, and we've been watching some peck there it is there's a peckish oxpecker oh we've been waiting for you to come back for like, for a long time with our peckish oxpecker but there we go an oxpecker pecking and a hungry peckish oxpecker as well but that's very cool to see that scissoring action of the beak just removing the ectoparasites the little pepper ticks those little first instars kind of like baby ticks basically that's what they specialize in so please do confirm my peckish oxpecker, and then believe it or not, that gives us four in a row already. But it does leave us with a trotting warthog. If we can find a warthog, I have no doubt that it will trot. Uh, but finding a warthog here can sometimes be a little bit tricky. I haven't seen many over the past few days, but I shall not give up hope. And we shall see if we can continue ticking off stickers. I know we are romping ahead at the moment, Odie. <laughs> but nice to see these kudus. I did wonder if that one was on her own, but uh, as expected, so if you just sit and watch and wait quietly, you'll be amazed what's actually around you that you just didn't pick up. Those disruptive markings, those white lines that you can see, there's our red-billed oxpecker, nice view of him. Those white lines that you can see on the romp are incredibly good camouflage. You wouldn't necessarily think it, um, but as soon as that thing stands still, it just disappears. I think most, uh, all the, the, the plants, the grass, the branches generally grow upwards towards the sun. Oop, well, it's getting a, getting a nice clean there. Uh, so just by standing still, it just breaks up the outline of that kudu. Um, and it is almost impossible to see, but the movement will give it away. And if you wait long enough, all of a sudden one kudu became about six and there's a young male in here maybe about a year old as well in this group that we were discussing the dynamics a little bit earlier 
Uh, it's always good to be patient out in the bush. We all get a little impatient sometimes, but if you really want to appreciate the bush, you need to just sit quietly and listen and wait. And I can guarantee there's more around you than you realise. I always work on the assumption that we probably see about 20% of what sees us on any drive. Oh, confirmation of the oxpecker. One times pecking oxpecker. Or peckish oxpecker. There we go. Look at that. Three, four in a row already. Just missing a trotting warthog. But we'll see what else we can... Oh, we've got another kudu nibbling there. But I, I will agree that we will find you different kudu rather than claiming we had multiple kudus nibbling. I won't ask for that one. So no, we are doing great guns. But I think perhaps that means it's time to continue on and see what else we can find. I'm still checking Aubrey's. This is uh, one of Tabungumi's favourite roads when he's moving through Juma. So you never know. But my gut reaction is that he is not here. But thank you everybody for confirming my peckish oxpecker and please do continue to send in your questions, your comments, your musings, your thoughts, uh, anything you'd like to discuss with us or have us attempt to answer. Uh, we are always willing to assist. It's also nice to know where you guys are from when you pose your questions as well. It's amazing the reach that we have and how many people we can affect. Ooh, I've got a dashing Stirnbok, but I think it's dashed completely out of view. Uh, we can just possibly get... You've got a view there, Owen. There it is. There's our little male Stirnbokky. No. <laughs> there went our little male Stirnbok. <laughs> Okay, a short but sweet visual of a Stirnbok. Quite normal to see one. Remember, impalas, yes, big gregarious herds, but Stirnbok are pretty much solitary animals. Uh, they do hang out in monogamous pairs, but don't regularly associate with one another directly, the male and the female.
All right, we're back out. The storm that was above us have passed in part. Uh, it's still overcast. One good thing, it didn't rain. It's just quite a lot of lightning that was around. But um, what it did do is brought a nice mass of cool air, which is a great relief. I tell you, today was arguably the hottest day so far for me this summer it was it was not nice it was really hot now it's nice and cool so it might be a good thing maybe our leaping leopard will appear so i'm just gonna check around let's see Ron is asking what is the Catman's next game plan? Well Ron, my next game plan is to find elephants and they are right here. In fact, a whole breeding herd of them. And I need to see what do I have. Do I have a trumpeting elephant? Do I have a embarrassed elephant? Let's take a look. Let's see. Ah, oh, there we go. Keep an eye on the youngsters. They often get very, very much embarrassed. Like I mentioned this morning, there's an influx of breeding herds to the area. Oh, this is going to be nice. Come to us. That little one looked like he was embarrassed when the other one pushed him. It's a nice hiding. He's embarrassed. Obviously looking for something specific here. I only have an embarrassed elephant. I don't have a trumpeting elephant today. Keep an eye on those youngsters. Keep an eye on them, those babies. They often do silly stuff, and then when they get disciplined, they're very embarrassed. closer to us now. That will be amazing if they can. This is magic. Look at this. And see the big cow leading them. Small herd. They're probably part of a bigger herd that's just temporarily detached, although there's a whole bunch of them down there. Fascinating creatures. Hello there, Betty. We have a question. Do you, can elephants actually smell rain from a distance? Betty, yes, indeed. I can smell it from a distance at times. It all depends if the wind's coming your way from the storm. They will certainly hear it. They will certainly be able to hear it. Here's the big mama crossing. With the old calf. Right, I have a confirmation that young elephant was indeed embarrassed. So it brings my tally to two in total, although nothing in a row yet. I'm just having fun with this bingo. I'm not gonna win it, I know. Here's those biting midges again. Every time we were with elephants, we get these biting midges. And they are agonizingly irritating. And there's these things often that the forktail drongos are after. 
when they fly around the elephants. And I'm going to have to move these things off, biting me all over. Station and Logo South come in. Four. Lovely sighting. Lovely sighting. Sure, these things are biting me. love watching them move like that. Little one, look at him, look at him. Oh, his bitches are bad, eh? That's very, very cute. Right, I think we should probably move on to our next plan. I think let's go further up north again and see if we can't find... Well, we still need some dashing impalas. We can do a few of those, see if we can find them. Dang beetle, little giraffe, buffaloes. Maybe move a bit north and see if we can't find those dugger boys that we saw earlier on the... Um, okay, we're going to have to move. These flies are now biting us into oblivion. Okay, well I know Taylor showed you a foam nest frog a little bit earlier in the drive, but we've also found one, and we've found one in full construction mode. We've got a male atop a female there, and I would think Taylor was probably explaining how that they, the frogs sort of produce that foamy mass with special glands on the back legs, and we can actually see it in process. There you go, you can see how she's whipping it up, kind of like egg whites. It's very, very soft, it's a bit like bubble bath at the moment, but that will solidify and she's depositing eggs in there and the male on top uh, is depositing sperm as the eggs come out remember in frogs it is external fertilization and in um, amphibians uh, mating is described oh. <laughs> sitting on her head <laughs> uh, as amplexus so you saw the way that the male was grasping the female oh, apparently he's had enough either he doesn't like an audience or he has done what needed to be done I have seen this before, where you've got one female and she's had like six or seven males all in there with her. Everybody depositing sperm left, right and centre. So I suppose that's good for genetic diversity, but it seems that male um, had her to himself. It's amazing, just a little bit of rain 
and it has just brought all this activity and all this life out in the bush. You can see a couple of white berries from a white berry bush just behind our foam nest frog as well. So I don't want to repeat what Taylor has said, but uh, I'm sure she mentioned that the tadpoles develop in this, they get heavier, uh, and as that uh, protective foam, which sort of hardens a bit like polystyrene, begins to uh, degrade, the tadpoles will drop into the water already partially developed. Have you got a darting dragonfly, eh? Have you got one? See if you can frame it. We've, we, we don't have a fidgety frog on our board today, unfortunately, but that's very nice to see uh, an actual foam nest frog in the process of creating its foam nest. Uh, we do, however, have a darting dragonfly, which we're just seeing if we can spot it. We've seen lots of dragonflies also, also ming. If you saw something flash across the screen, there you go, there, there is a a very darting dragonfly. You might see it whipping across the screen every now and again. And you can see one or two droplets of rain. There, 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 there it is. There it is. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it is a uh, a darting dragonfly. Certainly, there was one just flew across the left-hand side of the screen. But we've seen quite a few uh, mating over the last couple of days, doing their cartwheel thing, where the male grabs the female. Uh, with his claspers behind her head and she distends her abdomen uh, to allow the transfer of the spermatophore which is a little sperm packet and we've seen a lot of females flying along with the males still attached dipping uh, their abdomens into the water laying their eggs and they just drop down into the water and some of them will stick to vegetation uh, otherwise they will develop in the water and of course dragonfly nymphs when they do come out don't look anything like the adult they are predatory uh, and they live under the ground and you still got him there's definitely a dragonfly darting around on the right of screen there there we go now there's different life cycles in insects the three main ones we talk about are ametabolic hemimetabolic and holometabolic the holometabolic lifestyles are insects that have a pupal stage, so the most easy way to describe that is a caterpillar and then a pupa and then coming out as a butterfly. So a completely different um, body form, completely different physiology, usually a different habitat, usually a different diet, which is a wonderful way of being able to have twice as many things in the same area because you're not in competition with your larval stages. And then you have hemibetabolic in, uh, insects, which are things like stick insects and praying mantids and also the dragonflies fall into the hemimetabolic one but they're a slightly different one because in mantises and things or mantids and things the youngster looks exactly like the adult but it just lacks wings and reproductive organs and as it grows and sheds its, sheds its skin those uh, appendages start to appear but it's a complete change in dragonflies but it's not considered holometamorphic because they don't create a pupa. They literally just sort of hatch out of their skin. They ecdice out of their aquatic predatory form. And then they come out of that as a, as a dragonfly and uh, don't have the pupal stage. But it's still a hemimetabolic life cycle. Okay, so hopefully we can confirm some darting dragonflies for yet another tick on our board. But let's send you back across to Taylor and see how she's getting on. Goodness gracious, we are witnessing the shyest steenbok I've ever seen in my entire life. Look at how it's using the vegetation to conceal itself. <laughs> it actually did. But it is so far away from us now that it is just starting to relax. And I do indeed have a shy steenbok on, uh, on my bingo board. So we'll wait for confirmation for that. Um, typically with these antelope species, I mean, when you are an antelope that lives all by itself for the most part you know you really got to watch your watch your back and being out in the open you are quite vulnerable so sticking to the thickets but all the nice juicy plants have um, obviously come out in the open areas after all the rain and um, but this this individual is now starting to relax with us only because we're not staring at it necessarily and 
I don't know how far away it is, probably like 60, 70 meters away from us now. So we'll just watch it sort of disappear. Bye, Stianbok. Right, we've also got a host of other wildlife. I think uh, let's just have a quick scan. Actually, shall we have a look at this beautiful... Oh, there's the hornbill still sitting there. Are you? Go... Is the pole going to be in the way? Let's see. Maybe not. I'm sure, I'm sure that you all know that the rain roof and that it makes it a bit tricky. It's silhouetted red bill hornbill. That's quite something. And it has been holding a tiny little insect at the tip of its beak for the entire time. The entire time. Can you believe it? I don't know what it's planning on doing with it. I don't know if it's maybe nesting um, or if this is perhaps the male and there's a female in a cavity in this uh, dead leadwood tree and yeah maybe it's going to feed it. It's starting to drizzle now and then of course just to the right you can also see the silhouette of a leopard orchid. Now the first time that I ever saw this leopard orchid was back in 2016 and I cannot believe how it has actually grown and soon we might even be able to see flowers. Do you see those little bulbs, um, those sort of lighter green bulbs, obviously that's, uh, that's the flowers there so maybe while I'm here they will burst open giving us a, 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 yeah, a beautiful coloration of yellow with these sort of brown spots. That's of course why they are called leopard orchids. But I did get some confirmation, which is wonderful, that the shy Stiernbork is confirmed. So we're going to put it here and obviously now I immediately regret choosing that fidgety frog and I kind of wish I chose that one. But what can you do? The other thing that we do have is just off into the distance, we've got a couple of impala rams and they're not dashing in terms of speed, but of course words can be interpreted in many different ways. And these two impala rams are very dashing, don't you think? Look how handsome they are, strutting their stuff. Uh, these don't look like very old rams, I think. <laughs> like they, 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 they're not obviously young like, you know, from last season kind of thing, but they're a couple of years old, so feeling a bit on the frisky side. And, and naturally, the younger individuals will just sort of sport about like this. But nothing too serious. So, I'll wait for you to all let me know if dashing impala counts. I hope it does, otherwise I'm sure at some point we will find some impalas physically running away and I just probably need to sneeze loud enough and they'd get a bit of a fright. I'm only teasing, of course I will not be enticing um, anything. I have also just seen a daring dung beetle race past the car and I'm so tempted to go and chase after it but you know, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll get our turn, we'll, we will get our turn, that's for sure. You can see these in Palo are not very serious. Also, it's not ratting season right now. Oh, look, actually, if you're not convinced, in the distance, there are impalas dashing away. Look at that. Look at the speed at which that you and her youngster is sprinting. So in case you weren't convinced, but thank you for all of you for confirming the dashing impala. We will put a sticker on that too. You can always count impala. We'll be running at some point here, eh? doing something. But they are quite spectacular. Okay, I think I've only got one dashing impala on here, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just doing another quick look. I'm really going to look now because we've just arrived at Chitwa Dam. We're going to look for the hovering kingfisher. Barking baboon might be tricky and we're going to work exceptionally hard a bit later today. We're going to get that climbing chameleon. Let me go a bit forward though because there's so much else happening at the dam. I also haven't been back to Chitwa for such a long time and I love this dam. Lots of hippos. I want to see a baby hippopotamus. I'm just deciding where we're going to park. I think I'm probably just go a little bit ahead. Man, who remembers there's some water in front of us here, like on this sort of causeway, when it flooded and we had the um, catfish crossing and making their way over. That was quite epic. How is that for you, sir? That's cool. Is the response I got, so we shall take it. We shall park here. Hi, hippos. Obviously, it's a lovely, cool afternoon. 
The hippos are already wet, they are not phased by the rain at all. Um, and there is one individual that is, as you can see, standing up out of the water. Also giving a laugh. You all heard that, right? Mm -hmm. um, not me, there were hippos actually doing it. We've got laughing hippo on the board too. And of course, you know when you come to Chitwa, you are 100% going to get hippo vocalizations. It is not a difficult thing uh, to get at all. I wonder though if hippos are really like um, comedians. And do they tell funny jokes? Is that why they make that sound? Oh, of course, we know why they make that sound. And that's, oh, there's the little hippo. Look how sweet it is. Yes, show us your gums. That's so tiny. That's literally the whole reason why I came to Chitwa Dam was to see a little thing like that. They are so sweet. And I don't know if you all agree with me, um, but I'd love to hear from you what your favorite baby animal is. I am a huge fan of a hippo calf. I don't think that there is anything cuter because they are so brave at their age. They think that they, nothing can stop them, especially once they're, you know, a couple of weeks old to a couple of months old. Then they chase after other creatures. They go up to crocodiles and nibble on their tails. We used to see that in Kenya a lot. They are so funny. But look at it. It's like a tiny little jelly, jelly bean in comparison to, uh, to its mother. There, it could also be laughing. Ha, 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 Taylor, ha, 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 he's so funny. Mom, did you hear that? No, I'm just joking. That's, of course, not what the, the little hippopotamus is saying, but in my mind, that's what it's saying. It makes me feel better about myself. Um, <laughs> but it is so sweet. Honestly, I haven't got a clue as to how uh, old it is, but I... Oh, dashing impala. Bye. They just sprinted off past the screen, but you uh, were a bit, framed a bit higher. Um, I think that that little jelly bean over there is probably along the lines of, I don't know, maybe just over a month? maybe if even that it's so small but you can see it's kind of used to the water now it, you know it feels like quite looks like it feels quite comfortable in its surrounding oh and mom's sitting down again she's got quite a, uh, a different spot it's actually quite nice to see a hippo standing and then versus when they tuck their legs under themselves you get some kind of idea of how shallow the water is and obviously this female with such a young calf she is going to be sticking to the shallower sections of the water because those teeny tiny little legs are not going to be able to do much in the deep water. Hello. Just having the best time. And this is normally a behavior that we like, you know, we typically see in the afternoon when all the hippos start to get really active. But I'm so happy. It's really made my afternoon. Oh, what have you got there? It's found something. Look at, I don't know if it's got a piece of grass. It looks like in its, that it was just picked up and thrown around. We'll see if we can get another view of it. Pick it up again. Take it. It's like a stick. Nope. I'm so cute. Look at me go. Shame. It's a pity that they, I haven't seen any other teeny tiny hippos. Um, normally what you, what you could see is, you know, females with the youngsters might st kind of stick together. And I'm sure they do it on purpose so that the little ones can ir uh, play with one another and entertain themselves rather than having to borrow. Uh, what is wrong with me? I can't English today. Won't bother their moms. Um, but you can see she's very relaxed. She's not too perturbed about anything right now. She actually just like, looks like she wants to have a sleep. Little afternoon siesta. But that is lovely. Oh goodness, that was a full a full tumble. Oh, isn't that just absolutely precious? You could actually really do a great voiceover of this little hippo because it's almost silent. You can't hear any sounds from the hippo right now because it's a little bit further away. And a little bit of a scuffle that was happening with those other individuals that you saw on the bottom left. See, there's a couple of other hippos. There's a slightly older calf also amongst them. Oh, they're very active today. But with the cooler weather, that, of course, is to, is to be expected.
I'm sure you can hear the slight little pitter-patter of the rain too. It's just drizzling very gently. You see all the ripples on the water. Now there's a great question that's come through from Timothy this afternoon with regards to how protective is a female hippo over, uh, over their calves? Very. Most mothers, you know, they have that maternal instinct to try and protect their young at any cost, really. And I would not want to go in the water with a hippo in general, but definitely not a hippo with a young calf because she's not going to be able to move as quickly into the sort of deeper water to get away because the calf is not going to be able to keep up with her. She's going to be a bit slower with her movements and, and most likely uh, stand her ground rather than try and move away too quickly if, if she's unable to. Um, so yeah, not a good idea. Don't go and come between any mother animal and and their little ones, and and I, and th this goes without saying. This goes with warthogs most certainly. I mean, I've I've seen the craziest things. Where I've seen leopards or lions chasing after uh, you know a sow with her piglets, and the mom turns and literally turns back and chases the predator. You know, so be careful. I've watched so many people being chased by warthogs, and I would not like to be caught by one of them. Um, so yeah, so always just be very careful. Obviously accidents do happen and people can put themselves in the wrong place unintentionally. Just make sure you just back out quite slowly or sometimes you might need to get out of there a bit quicker. But for now, the hippo is at a, a nice distance. If she was unhappy with us being here, like we've parked quite far away, um, you can kind of see the distance at which we're at. She uh, would have shown us. She she would have been quite focused on us, maybe looking in our direction. She definitely would have been maybe opening her mouth, sort of doing a bit of a threat display. But as you can see, every single one of these hippos, they see vehicles all the time. And also, you know, if I were to get out the car and walk to the water's edge, which I'm absolutely not going to do, then you'd most certainly get a reaction. Or if I drove the car too close to the water's edge, then we'd see some negative behavior. But um, that's obviously not why we're out here is we want to view these animals in the the best way possible and keep them nice and calm too munch 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 yes you need another little hippopotamus to play with and when they and when they two, like two little hippos get together goodness gracious it is hysterical they just stand there mouthing one another thinking that they're super regressive and everyone's fearing for them and then the people turn into laughing hippos There we go, another laugh from a hippopotamus. Right, so I believe that the laughing hippo is absolutely confirmed, so we're going to uh, mark that on. Sorry, I just wanted to let you all enjoy that moment because it was quite lovely. And um, the board is not going away, away and neither is the sticker, maybe just the stickiness, but I've been playing with it now. So, oh, do I have more than one laughing hippo? No, I don't think so. I've only got the one. Boom, I, I, I need to be better at at choosing here yeah, because everything is kind of going all over the show. Are we allowed to get creative and like, does it, can it be diagonal? Yeah. So, okay, cool, just double checking. Just double, everyone has different rules. Oh, but look at this, all sorts of action here with the birds. We've got a blacksmith lapwing, obviously. Look at it, how it's lowered itself. Look how angry it is. So angry. And it is because it is chasing a Thickney, a water thickney. Look at it go. Sorry, there's the bar again across the screen. <laughs> and the water thickneys are kind of just moving out and there's and just in the in the road. Obviously we this is the section of the um the dam wall going on to Chitwa Dam. Bye birds. You don't need to do that. There's so much water around. Like I, I don't know what what are you protecting? What are you chasing away? And then something that's even funnier that might happen is that blacksmith lapwing is most likely going to turn back and go back in the direction that it came and now there's a three-banded plover which is also look at it the, they make me laugh no don't be behind the bar i'm not going to move it's going to come out there we go what are you going to go do now now these two bird species always having arguments blacksmith lapwings and uh and the three-banded plovers i don't know maybe there's some insects on the road that's caught its attention they're also the world's fastest moving bird not really, don't quote me on that, but uh, definitely a challenge. I think a, if you're learning to operate a camera, I think a good one to practice on is uh, trying to, to follow birds. 
and off it goes. I'm just trying to think if we can <laughs> add anything else to our bingo board. Can we stop there, please? Because now we have got some leopards making love. Now this is not like when a baby human bites your finger. Let's push play on this episode of The Wild Show. We have a marching millipede, which isn't in our board, but because of uh, our 12 days of Christmas bingo bonanza that we're having, I seem to have made the decision to make everything an alliteration where possible. There's some great green grass that it's uh, slithering into. <laughs> Check those legs there, eh? there's like little waves and waves of activity. But that's a big one. He's going to disappear into the grass now, typically. That was probably oh, about a good six inches, I would think, that millipede. And disappearing into the grass. But a very important and underappreciated part of the ecosystem. They are what are known as the decomposers. They generally feed on detritus, so decaying plant matter. Uh, when it comes to the nutrient cycle, it's all very well and good passing all the nutrients from the grass to the consumers, etc, etc. But, oops, sorry, someone's trying to reach me on the radio, they will have to wait. Uh, but there has to be a missing link to get that now digested material back into the soil for the plants to use again. And things like termites and millipedes are those decomposers that are the missing link to that nutrient cycle and the cycle would stall if it wasn't for them. They're the ultimate recyclers of the bush and dung beetles, of course, as well. We've seen a couple of those when they bury those balls. That's returning nutrients to the soil. It's like fertilising your garden. All right, I think our millipedes carry has disappeared now, so we must carry on. We are, of course, still looking for the only sticker we need to complete our column and a triumphant round of bingo, which is a trotting warthog. Now, annoyingly, I've just come down in Parlour Plains and we saw warthog tracks trotting up the road but in the direction that we came from. So I'm gonna do one more loop in the hope that perhaps we just miss something or they pop out. But we have 
various other things to do. I think, how many stickers did we get the other day? We had 10 stickers the other day, didn't yeah. we? Maybe, maybe we should try and better our record. Or was it even 11 stickers? Yeah, so decomposers, don't forget about the decomposers. We get so bogged down in the, uh, the elephants and the lions and the leopards and the, the other, what I consider the marquee animals out here. Uh, but there are so many parts of the ecosystem that would not function if it wasn't for some of those smaller and less considered organisms. And some, of course, sort of do self-recycling as well. Buffalo are a good example of that. You get a big herd of buffalo moving through an area. They produce an awful lot of dung whilst they're walking. And as the herd is walking, the ones in the front defecate and the ones behind tread it into the soil and the weight of them pushes the, the dung uh, under the surface and that's also sort of self-fertilization I suppose uh, enhancing the grass for the next year just thought we'd check up Triple M I don't normally like driving the main roads here uh, hey we've got power lines and things in the way but warthogs eat grass and because this is a cut line between the two properties Juma on our right and Simbambili on the left uh, there's often a fire break in this sort of shorter area of grass here, just in case there was a natural fire from a lightning strike or something. Uh, hopefully it wouldn't then jump across uh, one of these main roads, but I see no evidence of grazing warthogs or trotting warthogs for that matter. Maybe we must check quarantine as well. Oh, we've got some kudus right next to us. Sorry, kudus. Another nibbling kudu. Not the same kudus we saw earlier, I assure you. We are now on power lines. Those ones were on Aubrey's. Enjoying this green flush. You can see how green the bush is looking at the moment. Uh, and kudus are also not that picky. They'll have their favoured foods, of course, but they have been documented eating, I've, I've seen to recall reading somewhere, over a hundred different plant species. And that's why they are to some extent considered a bit of an indicator species, along with warthog, uh, for the condition of your felt. Because they can eat pretty much anything, you know, if your kudus really start to struggle, uh, then you can rest assured that you don't really have much food available for your browsing animals and if you're in a farm situation it might be a good time to consider supplementary feeding. And then warthogs as well are a good indicator for grazing capacity. Uh, capacity. They, they do struggle in droughts, warthogs, and that grass dies off in very dry periods, even the roots sort of shrivel up and that uh, sort of wedge-shaped face of a warthog is well designed to snuffle over and, and eat the roots so if there's nothing left in the roots the warthogs start to struggle again good indication that your grazing capacity has been well is no more Speaking of indicator species, frogs as well, which we saw earlier, also a good indicator species of an ecosystem's health. Afternoon, Nancy. Um, I would have to actually sort of find a book to tell you the exact structure, but the, if we compare it to, say, something like a cat, which has got the carnassials at the back of the mouth for slicing through flesh, uh, obviously a kudu doesn't need that, so it has uh, sort of premolars and molars at the back, um, and then some incisors at the front. Um, I would imagine, I think, probably just on the, uh, the, the bottom jaw, like most antelope. And the top jaw is more of a sort of a bony palate. Um, but I would have to do some dentistry or sort of check a book to make absolutely sure for you. I couldn't tell you how many teeth are in there. Although, do I still have that? Or is it in Rusty? I actually found a tooth the other day. And I put it in the car for later use from a zebra. 
uh, which would have a similar tooth structure, but I think it was actually, I think I was on Rusty at the time. That's a shame. That would have been a nice demo. Maybe Are next time. <laughs> Just some ears sticking out. Look at that lovely vibrant greens today. Beautiful big brown eyes on this kudu, watching us very carefully, possibly because I've just put on my rain jacket, and so a little bit of movement attracted its attention. Okay, as you can see, the rain is falling a little bit now. It's still I wouldn't suggest much more than a, a heavy drizzle at the moment. But this kudu is definitely watching us carefully. Okay, Odie, I think let's carry on and see if we can find a trotting warthog up the road somewhere. We, there are tracks to suggest that there are some in the area. I don't think I've ever officially tracked a warthog before, but Bingo does strange things to a man. That's true, actually. Thank you, Odie. I forgot. Down here, we have another kudu a nibbling, and I think you would agree that that kudu, the first one we showed you, was indeed nibbling. So, if possible, please could we get confirmation on on our second kudu a nibbling? Thank you, Odie. I'd forgotten about that. I'm getting, I've got I'm too warthog focused. Come on, warthogs, where are you? We actually did see a, a little family of warthogs here the other day, that's why I'm just double checking this area with three little piglets. We've moved off from Chitwa Dam, as you of course can see, but we are now looking for dancing zebra. I, I mean, realistically, if we find zebra, whether or not they'll be dancing, eh, probably not. So we're just on Chitwa's airstrip, having a quick look around, uh, just to see what we can see, because there's quite a few big open areas here with really nice grazing that we typically would see, you know, lots of zebra and we've seen them many times. But also, because it's so nice and open in the evenings, especially when it gets quite windy, uh, it's a great place for animals. They'll often quite come and sleep in this area because they can sort of see their surroundings a bit better, which means lots of feces or scat potential for dung beetles. That's the idea anyways, but uh, I've only seen dung beetles flying. I haven't, um, I haven't really, it's a couple of old buffalo dung. I haven't really seen um, any just crawling around on the ground. So we're just gonna keep an eye out for that. And then I'll most likely go on towards like the northern side of Chitwa Dam. I just want to check to see if there is a, a pied kingfisher. Um, like I said, that's gonna be our, our hovering kingfisher species. And we'll, we'll kind of try from there. So we're just taking a bit of a slow drive, keeping an eye out. Um, and of course, if anything else shows itself, well, we're not going to say no to it. 
still, still would like elephants, but I can't have everything. I've just had the baby hippo, and that's really what I uh, what I wanted to see. I can't believe there's not much planes game around. It's surprising, very surprising. Lots of little swallows, all moving around. Deborah, hmm, what have I missed the most about Juma? Ah, uh, lots of things. I don't, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head if there's one thing in particular. I mean, I, love, I really like everything about Juma. I think it's a fantastic property for its size. It, you know, when it's quiet, it's quiet. But for the most part, there's, it's always action packed. And I think that that's quite special when you are limited um, by, you know, the size of the entire property. I, oh, I'm trying to think. I suppose I, no, I missed the elephants of Pridelands. I was going to say elephants, and I was like, no, Pridelands elephants, we had some, like, I had some amazing moments there. I almost had some amazing moments here. I'd actually, speaking of elephants and something I'd like to see, I wonder if Half Trunk and her herd still pass through here, obviously seeing Fang, a female elephant with a tusk that points backwards would be quite nice, because I've, I've seen her for years, even down when I was working in the southern parts of the Sabi Sands, so uh, she's quite a character of this area. Um, God, Deborah, I know that's ridiculous. I, the hyenas, I, I really, really enjoyed obviously having the opportunities to spend so much quality time with hyenas, getting to know them. I know that, uh, well, I was informed that their den has, has moved uh, onto Little Gauri. So hopefully we'll catch a glimpse of him every now and then. Obviously Ben this morning with um, Maribs and, uh, you know, a carcass. The hi he's got a higher chance of, of seeing the hyenas. So yeah, a little bit of everything. I mean, uh, Juma was my home for quite a while. I obviously have some really, really fond memories, yeah. My, one of my favorite moments though, and it's something that I actually haven't ever seen again to the same degree, Deborah, is the bullfrogs. Uh, I think it was my first year, so it must have been in 2016 when the rains first arrived, uh, around Twin Dams. That whole section just filled up like you won't believe and it was just unbelievable. We had so many African bullfrogs jumping around, males competing for females, and that was quite spectacular. Uh, so that's something that I haven't really had the chance to see again. I've seen lots of, actually lots of baby bullfrogs when I was on a, another reserve a bit further to the west, uh, but, and we obviously actually just closed the section of the road completely because they were all uh, moving around. And, and that was amazing, but like still, the fact of having those adults fighting like that was definitely something special. Actually, we're going to drive very soon around the corner is where I had that wonderful sighting of the dwarf mongoose that decided to play dead in front of the hornbills. And so that was quite cool. So I've definitely had lots of memorable uh, moments on Juma and the surroundings. I, I suppose we can include Chitwa. Lots and lots of fond memories, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm just still just keeping an eye out for, for, for any of those donkeys. I can't believe we haven't seen another one. I mean, I think that that's quite ridiculous. The rain has not 100% stopped, but stopped for the most part. It's still just drizzling on and off. much as it likes, but I'm not too worried. Yeah. The red-chested cuckoo calling in the distance. Lots and lots of different little birds. From Crested Franklins to ring neck doves, you name it, it's probably calling. 
Right, we're definitely going to continue our search for some contenders for the bingo board. We haven't stopped. We're just um, having a little break. Ben is so far ahead of me. I don't know what I'm going to do to catch him. And um, I'm not sure if I should wish him luck to find his tr uh, dashing or trotting warthog. We'll see. Ah, Taylor, don't give up hope because this trotting warthog has given me problems. I've checked the only place, in fact, I've only seen a couple of warthogs over the last few weeks. I've checked the area where we last saw warthogs and there seems to be, well, there are some tracks, but no visual of any warthogs. So I'm going to check quarantine. The only other place I've seen a warthog is a treehouse dam, um, but that warthog is now, well, been consumed by those black dam males. So, we have a problem um, and but we do have a few other things on the list but you mentioned elephants Taylor as well I have splashing elephants I've got trumpeting elephants but I haven't seen an elephant for a couple of days which is a bit strange excuse uh, Odie's hands there we're just giving the lens a wipe because we have had some rain uh, but I'm going to go past Gary Dam momentarily well in the next 10 minutes or so where I'm looking forward to ticking off a scampering terrapin and a silent Egyptian goose. I am slightly nervous about the silent part of Egyptian geese, knowing the ones that we have here. But we did see the other day, or yesterday, um, that we've got some new Egyptian goose chicks at Gary Dam. I'm not sure if they've been seen on dam cam today, but I'd like to see if we still have four. We had four there yesterday. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to go back and check on the beautiful Marips uh, and see if he is still enjoying what's left of his Dacre kill from yesterday. And I do need a leaping leopard, so hopefully he's in a tree. If he's still there. Right. Only keep your eyes peeled for a warthog. We're now on quarantine, nice open grassy area. I have seen warthog here in the past. But all the warthog at Juma, I'd say all of them, there aren't many around, but the ones we do have always seem to be very, very skittish. So I fear that unless we find one whilst you are with us, it's going to be difficult to put on camera. Afternoon Charles, a uh, local from Southgate in Johannesburg, good to hear from you. Um, well, warthog tracks I suppose are probably easier to find than the warthogs themselves, but it depends on your area and depends where you go. Warthog tracks are quite easy to recognise, they're very blocky, they're very square in shape. Um, difficult to show you or to explain it without seeing it, but imagine a box with a line down it, because it's sort of cloven hooves, so they make two little um, rectangular impressions that sort of end up with this very sort of blocky type track and you can tell where they've been walking because the front will be more uh, dug into the sand because they put pressure on their toes when they push off, off uh, from their feet and don't forget just like uh, cows and buffalo as well they've also got those dew claws so those two little sort of residual toes that are up here and in deep soft sand or in mud where they often like to wallow. If the, si the foot sinks down deep enough, you'll see those two little marks of the dew claws as well. We also have bush pig here as well, uh, but I've never seen one here, nor have I seen a track in this area. The problem is we've got such a high leopard population and leopards do enjoy a warthog. Difference between a bush pig and a uh, warthog track. So the warthog track, very sort of square and blocky shaped, sort of like that. Uh, a bush pig track kind of looks like Pac-Man, so it's more rounded edges and then has a big V cut out of the direction of travel, so it's almost sort of like, I'll kind of make a heart shape there, but uh, so let me try and get it on the camera. So you've got the rounded edges and then the, the toes sort of cut in at the middle, so imagine like Pac-Man, that's how I recognise a bush pig track. Okay, let's see if Taylor has caught me up at all and I'm going to head to Gary Dam and see if I can find a silent Egyptian goose and a scampering terrapin.
Ben, I can't. You're just too good at this game. This is my first first one. You've got to give me a chance. Anyways, we have not got something that's on our bingo board, but I could not help. And, uh, and I, I'm definitely not going to drive past this because I am besotted with bugs and on this beautiful African wattle that is flowering we have got some chafer beetles. Now I am uncertain exactly which ones they are. They they kind of look like amethyst uh, chafer beetles but you know if they aren't because they're quite small too they will most certainly be in the leucocellus family so something along those lines. I've tried to identify them before but I couldn't get an exact ID. Uh, I suggested amethyst chafer beetle initially and then a couple of the beetle experts didn't disagree with me but they just suggested maybe just put it in that genus and I did not bring my my insect book with me this evening because I was worried, obviously worried about the rain so I really didn't bring many but there are plenty on here and they're feeding on the flowers um, so we've got from just individuals sort of moving around and we're going to hopefully find a mating pair um, there's plenty of the beetles that are mating so I'm excited for the bug boom uh, that's that's sort of about but this we're actually really lucky because it's a, such a nice close-up we've parked pulled up right next to the tree which allows us to to view these creatures and you know most people at a glance we dismiss arthropods of all kinds because you know we find them annoying and they fly into our faces and this and I'm the first one to to complain especially about uh, arth uh, insects and the diptera families um, order so flies they drive me insane if you want to see me get angry what have a fly land in my face unnecessarily however <laughs> beetles I definitely do uh, appreciate and the coleoptera order that beetles are in is actually one of the largest insect orders in the world but I'm surprised that there aren't any uh, little flower beetles because they you know they typically would be around here but perhaps it's just too much competition with so many of these uh, little little chafer beetles and they're, they're beautiful so depending on uh, how much sunlight we have they might change in color not because they have color changing capabilities but look at that one there do you see how it's got the iridescence now of almost an emerald green a sort of amethyst color right and um, with that sort of r rusty brown uh, head uh, but what's happening is on the the outside uh, on the chitinous sort of uh, shell let's call it that for the lack of better words because my brain is not working today although it doesn't work on most days um, is you'll actually see that there are tiny tiny if you look under a microscope almost like little conical uh, pits that they have covering their carapace and with the different ways that light is reflected and it reflects at obviously different angles you might get a sort of deep blue coloration and then of course uh, when there's a little bit more light present, uh, you, 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 you get the sort of greens coming through. But this is so stunning to see. So I encourage people not to dismiss, dismiss arthropods and to poke your head in a tree. You'll be surprised at what you might see. But you do have to stare for, for quite some time. But you can see them very, very actively feeding around here. I would love to get out there and show you how big they are, but I don't want to go and disturb them. I know me towering over them is not going to be great, but there we go. There they are. Mating, mating beetles. I want to sing a song about mating beetles. I can't remember it though. Maybe it will come to me at some point. It's quite annoying. It's not really nice at all. It will get stuck in your head and drive you insane. So perhaps I won't be singing that today. Also lots and lots of ants. And you can imagine, just in the background on the right, they'll be enjoying uh, the pollen from the flowers too. Very high energy source. Uh, it looks like there's a tiny little like, aphid or something moving around too, but very camouflaged. So it's just great. The, the longer you stare at a plant, the more you start to see. And I also just really appreciate the bug life, or a bug's life, is because of all these little interactions um, that we, we completely missed. You can see the ants are quite happily moving around, the the chafer beetles, and then there's that other little green thing. I'm not sure what it is, but like I said, it, maybe it's a type of plant hopper, or perhaps it's a, uh, yeah, like I said, but oh my gosh, now I've, now I've got my favorite thing in the whole wide world on the dash in front of the vehicle. But I'm going to show you that in just a minute. My 
Chateau Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Meshatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Meshatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 Well, we didn't find any warthogs on quarantine, but we did find a hyena quite far away at the moment. So again, as always, I shall ask for your incredibly knowledgeable assistance in a positive identification. And somewhere behind the bushes is definitely June, because there were two of them walking um, across quarantine. And we saw June with her characteristic floppy ear, but she's just behind that bush. She stopped down... Uh, stops to have a and lay down to have a bit of a scratch. I think she had a, a bit of a tick problem, uh, which this hyena found very very funny and cackled heartily to itself. But obviously that we couldn't get that on camera, unfortunately, because funnily enough we do need a cackling hyena for our bingo board. Uh, but I don't think even I can strain to find any justification for this hyena currently cackling. Maybe June is cackling. Let's see if we can find you June as well and just change up the angle of this one in case we're struggling for an ID. Looks like a younger hyena. I don't know if it's Gingrika perhaps again from this morning because we're not too far away from where Emma um, Rips had his kill or has his kill. There's June. Okay, we'll give you a view of June in a moment. I know we've had no updates on the June bugs of late. Oh, June just laughed uh, or yawned. Could have been a laugh. There is June. You can see that floppy ear on the right of uh, we're looking at it, so her left hand ear. I hope this is June. I know June does have a floppy ear. She's one of the few hyenas that I'm sort of positive or more confident identifying, I should say, because of that floppy ear, and then, of course, we've got Ribbon with no tail. The other ones do prove a bit of a mystery to me. I seem to have a mental block uh, with the other hyenas. I've even been out with Tess, and she's tried to show me the, the spot patterns and things on the side, and I'm afraid that I just don't see them. <laughs> but we haven't seen very many hyenas of late. Yes, June, we're discussing you, but I haven't seen June for a long time.
He had a sort of an interesting little exchange with a group of male impalas on the way over. The impalas were watching them. That's very kind of you, uh, Julu, but I, I don't think that I'm going to be able to get confirmation for these hyenas unless they randomly start cackling now. But we'll see. Maybe the, our audience is feeling generous. It is very interesting to me how the impalas, they obviously know the way a hyena moves because they were watching the hyenas approach, but nobody alarmed, and they let the, the, the hyenas got to probably about... 20 meters away from the impalas, and then they just gave the hyenas a bit of space. But there was no panic, there was no concern. Um, so they're obviously quite comfortable that here our hyenas really don't do much hunting, if at all. But of course, that is a bit, bit of a misnomer that hyenas do not hunt at all. Ah, is that Comet? Okay, well, I don't know if I've ever officially seen Comet. Thank you, Shreyas, for that one. I will try and make a mental note of Comet. So we've got June and Comet. Let's have a look at Comet, see if we can find a, a distinguishing feature. A little, a little bit of white around the shoulder there. A little nick out of that left ear. It's a, such a shame that the, uh, the Juma clan has moved on to the other side of Gary Dam and we're not getting the, the views and the window into their lives that we were getting a few months ago. But it is quite normal for hyenas to move den sites and I'm sure they'll be back at some point. They will reuse old dens. But as many of you probably know, hyenas are not known for their levels of personal hygiene. Um, and especially when they've got uh, cubs uh, like they have at the moment or have had recently, when they're all staying in one mound, the parasite build-up of fleas and mites and everything gets pretty intense and they're almost forced to move every so often because it just becomes unbearable even for a hyena. Quite a rufous sort of mane he's got going on there, a bit more rufous perhaps than a standard uh, hair on the back of the neck. Good afternoon, Hannah. Thank you so much for the question. I love getting questions from our younger viewers um, because you are going to inherit these things, so it's very important that you understand what you are getting. Um, I wouldn't say they enjoy spending time in the rain, but they're fairly indifferent about it, really. They still have to do what they do. It's not like us. We sort of, all oh, it's raining. We'll lock ourselves inside and put the TV on and lie on the sofa. Animals still have to be animals. They still have to eat. They still have to drink. Uh, they still have to do territorial patrols. But you'll find if it's just a little bit of light rain, like we've had over the last half an hour, that does seem to have stopped now. That won't stop them. They'll move around quite happily. If it's really torrential rain and it's properly pouring, then they, like pretty much all other animals, will just go and lie under a bush and hope that it stops. But if it goes on and on and on for hours and hours and hours, eventually they will just have to put up with it and carry on doing what needs to be done. But I would say they have a they they don't like it, but they also don't really have a problem with it. It's uh, I think it's only us that make as much fuss about the rain, perhaps, as uh, some of the other animals out here. But thank you very much for the question, and please do keep them coming, especially from our younger viewers. Anything you'd like to know, ask myself, Taylor, Chris, Lisa, and we would be delighted to assist. Hey, June. She looks sad, or tired, maybe just tired. Not often you see two hyenas just lying in the middle of quarantine like this. Kind of white eyebrows there 
Uh, do you think, or is that uh, just the trick of the lions? Laughter lions. <laughs> Eddie's suggesting laughter lions from all the cackling that keeps happening when we're not on camera. I wonder if they're going to end up with Marips and his Dacre kill at some point uh, in once it gets dark. They're not too far away from it. If they get a whiff, if the wind picks up from that area. Although, if you look at the lay of the land, where Marips is, is downhill from here and generally late afternoon. Oh, maybe there's a whiff of Dacre on the air there. Uh, late afternoon, the winds tend to sort of fall down towards the drainage lines, which is closer. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a tenuous laugh perhaps there uh, so theoretically the wind should be going in the wrong direction but their noses are pretty amazing so we'll have to wait and see what an awesome sighting Ben I am very jealous hyenas are by far one of my favorite animals but we do have another one of my favorites. It is a very curious black rhino. It's, I've been following it all the way from the actual tree line when it came out and it is definitely trying to pick up on someone's scent. Not sure if it's trying to pick up on a female scent or perhaps another male that marked its territory. But you can see he's definitely got his <laughs> Shane definitely got his face in the clouds the whole time. Who are you looking for, beautiful? Of course, we did have the other black rhino here earlier on, or I should say another black rhino. And I really am loving it here at Okokoyo. I'm slowly getting to know the different dynamics of the animal. Oh, we've got a giraffe hiding in the corner at the top left of your screen as well. <laughs> Just chilling there in the bush. Hmm. Yes, of course, now you move now that I've spotted you and called you. <laughs> I was just trying to camouflage with the trees. Come on, Rhino. Come on down to the watering hole. -da 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 -da. I think we should, I feel like we should write a song. <laughs> for the Mickey Mouse Rhino and we've got some more giraffes I have finally found some dashing impala rams. Goodness, of all things, one would have thought that would be the easiest to find. But for some reason, possibly with the storm that we had, the wind, they probably went to hide. And now that most of it is blown over, the storm seems to have moved further southeast. We have some dashing impala. Whoa! Now they're literally dashing, <laughs> but they are dashing in the sense that they are very handsome and very, very confident. In fact, those two rams look like they might even be so confident that they're going to try and square up with each other. Look at how he's standing, very regal. Oh, there's one running. Definitely some dashing impala rams, these. 
I reckon I should get that. Let's wait for some confirmation on that. I'm sure I'll get that. Or maybe just not. I'll find another one. Light is losing, so we might, uh, we're gonna lose out on things like ox peckers and those things, and butterflies and wallowing warthogs. But I might still get buffalo, I might still get giraffe. Oh, and dashing impala is confirmed. Now, where are we putting it? We've got two. Let's put it there, let's put it there. Then it takes our two in a row. And our total on three. Now it's not a good total, but I think considering weather and everything, almost every time we got on, we got something. I'm gonna drive around the con see if we if I can just do that dung beetle now before it's dark. I'm not gonna get monkeys now. I think they're already starting to prepare for the night. If we can get a dung beetle, giraffe and buff, we can probably still get at night with the IR. And at least we can try and aim for a max of four. I mean, we're not going to win it necessarily, but remember, our scores are being totaled. And towards the end, on Christmas Day, we will actually announce the overall winner. Anyway, let's head over to Ben to see what he's up to. Well done, Chris, on your dashing impalas. Uh, but we have some oddly silent Egyptian geese, which we needed to find. I only see this pair here. Uh, I was looking, I was hoping to find that pair we saw yesterday with four little chicks. But I'm not sure whether this is the same pair or not, because we have, have had a lot of Egyptian geese around Gary Dam recently. Possibly the chicks are sheltering underneath the one lying on the ground there. But um, I don't see any evidence of other ones. I'd be surprised if they've gone elsewhere though. Because those chicks were still pretty young. And we did see four. I think it was yesterday, possibly the day before. There are quite a few terrapins in the water. But I've been looking for one scampering along the bank somewhere. But it seems in that regard I have been thwarted thus far. I'm not sure whether can, can terrapins scamper through the water. I suppose they are still moving their feet quickly in a sort of a scampering motion. Or maybe we should say, th in this part of Gary Dam is very, very shallow. So this terrapin is in fact scampering along the bottom uh, of the dam. Quite a few milling around. In fact, just from where I'm sitting, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or twelve terrapins moving around in the water. I don't know, that one's, yeah, it looks like he's toting a bit of camouflage on the base of his shell. Maybe it's got wedged. <laughs> little bit of, little bit of vegetation along with that one. Yeah, I don't know what's happened there. I assume he was it's probably scampering along the bank at some point and has got a little bit of grass trapped under his shell. <laughs> ah, now the geese are no longer silent. Ah, well, just as well my silent Egyptian geese were confirmed, thank you very much, because they just made a fuss because another one flew overhead. But they have gone silent again now. Now the problem is I've got two silent Egyptian geese options. I'm trying to see which one is going to be more likely. One is in a line with splashing elephants, a soaring vulture and a hovering kingfisher. 
So I've got a Silent Egyptian goose up here and one in the bottom corner. Is, oh, actually, I keep forgetting we can do diagonals as well. Hmm, doesn't really help. What do you reckon, Owen? Top or bottom? Well, if I put it here, I get three along the bottom, but I don't think we're going to get wild dogs. That's the problem. Not no sign of dogs. No, then two in a row. I, but I agree. I think this is probably the best one. We need to make a decision. So there we go. Silent Egyptian geese. We need some splashing elephants. Maybe we're lucky an elephant comes down to drink whilst we're here. And I also need a hovering kingfisher. Keeping an eye out for that. Have you found some more scampering terrapins? Look at them scampering along in the water. <laughs> Deary me, what bingo does to us, hey? <laughs> but good to see a healthy terrapin population here, actually. But they'll be feasting on all the aquatic insects in there. They do eat some vegetable matter as well. Of course, one of the things they're most or very famous for doing is having that symbiotic relationship with uh, things like buffalo and rhino that come down to drink. Uh, and then you'll see uh, terrapins sort of rushing towards them and picking the ticks off, uh, similarly to an oxpecker. That poor injured buffalo that we were seeing up at Buffalzook Dam a few days ago, when he went into the water, there was a cloud of terrapins around him feasting on his wounds and the ticks there and also sort of any of the decaying tissue uh, around there because that's all good food for terrapins. But we left June and Comet still up there on quarantine. I, I wouldn't be surprised though if they turn up at Maribs's tree and that will be the next place that we're going to go and have a look at, which may then draw a bit of a halt to the bingo board, because I don't think we'll have a warthog trotting past. But you never know, I suppose. It looks like there's quite a lot of algae build-up on the shell of that terrapin as well. I saw a leopard take a terrapin once. If anyone has ever picked up a terrapin, uh, you'll know what I'm going to say now because they do smell pretty unpleasant. They've got glands to release a, a pug pugnant smell uh, as a defence mechanism and they will also excrete on you. And this terrapin, it was, sorry, this young male uh, leopard had caught a terrapin. He was walking up a drainage line with it and you could... <laughs> It's not often that you can sort of see what a cat is thinking, not like you can with an elephant, perhaps. Uh, but this young male was quite emotive at the time, and he was walking up, and you can kind of see he just stopped, dropped this terrapin out of his mouth, gave it a very disdainful look, and then just left it and carried on walking. I think, obviously, the terrapin did something very unpleasant in his mouth, and with the sensitive smell that the leopard got, he, he decided that terrapin was off the menu. A very effective defence mechanism. So we've got a blacksmith lapwing over there on the left, Odie, as well. There were three or four of them there before. I'm not sure what happened to the other ones. Okay, we are going to head in the direction of Marips and see if we can find him with his Dacre kill. Uh, let's send you over to Chris, who I think is appreciating some of the beautiful views at Pridelands. Well, I thought we'll take a quick break off the competition and just appreciate these colours of the sunset. A 
let's just enjoy that in a moment of silence. Such a beautiful scene with that knobthorn tree. Mountains somewhat in the background, beautiful colors of the sky. Beautiful, typical Bushveld scene. Soon it will be dark and then we'll probably head over into our IR and look for some nighttime creatures or try and use the IR to find some of the remaining bingo animals. And I totally agree there with Sam. Who says Pridelands always has the best sunsets? It's hard to beat, Sam. Really hard to beat a Pridelands sunset. I think it's because we have a slightly different type of bushveld here, the very large knobthorn trees in areas like this with smaller shrubs around it. So you can actually get that beautiful tree up on the skyline so from a composition perspective it really works and what you're looking at here is exactly what I'm seeing with the naked eye it's exactly what I'm looking at now it's not a camera trick what you see there it's literally looking at my monitor it's a it's it's a double image So it really does look like that at the moment. And that is just marvelous. On the twelve days of Christmas, wild earth has planned to see Twelve hippos hiding, eleven weavers weaving Ten leopards leaping, nine ostrich dancing Eight liner lying, seven ellies swimming Six cheetah chasing, five buffalo Four calling cubs, three giraffes Two crocodiles, and a naughty vervet monkey
Well, we've got hyenas. We had two of them, in fact. Um, we are just near Twin Dams, but they unfortunately are not on our side of the road. Um, but we will watch them until they sort of disappear. There was there was a second one. Um, I don't know who it was though. Unfortunately, I'm so out of touch with all of the hyenas. Um, and it has been a long time. But this one is quite pale in coloration. Looks quite light. I know it's a bit tricky to see. Uh, we'll just stick her and see if it does maybe decide to come around and do another loop. Um, but then there was definitely a female with this individual. Uh, it looked like she was um, a suckling some cubs. Um, already uh, very very tattered ears, but I don't think corky or ribbon. I'm, I'm actually not sure. I did manage to snap a photo, so I'll try and uh, maybe post it a little bit later, and you can all tell me who it was. But a nice brief sighting. Sadly, no laughing involved. I was in fact crying because they disappeared. I'm not going to say rude because I really like hyenas. Okay, what we are going to do though is we're going to just quickly go across to Twin Dams. Uh, we tried it, Chitwa, no luck with a pied kingfisher and unfortunately it's now starting to get quite dark so I think our chances of completing our bingo will not happen today. But that's fine, we've got many more afternoons to play because a kingfisher is going to be a tricky one. Barking baboon, maybe there's still a chance. I wonder if it counts if we hear it. Ah, so, okay, that apparently was Swazi. And in my mind, I was thinking, I was like, maybe it is him because that's one hyena I see pop up every now and then um, from all the social media groups. Wonderful, very cool. So, uh, yes. But then um, I couldn't remember and I thought, let me not embarrass myself and try and guess because I really can't remember if anyone is. Right. <gasps> yes, I know Swazi was quite a funny one, I think, because Swazi, I think everyone thought was a, a male for a very long time. It's so incredibly difficult to sex hyenas. It truly is. Even the experts get it uh, wrong sometimes. But what we do have at Twin Dams is not a monitor lizard, sadly, but we do have two yellow-billed storks and then there were a couple in Impala, but we've seen Impala, so we will just focus on the stalks right now. I'm surprised that uh, Twin Dams doesn't actually have more water in it. Its uh, water level is quite low, in fact, as you can see as this bird wades through it with its beak slightly open, hoping to feel some movement of a fish or a frog or anything really, and then it will snap its bill closed. It's also Maybe some unhappy go-away birds in the drainage line. And that's nice to, of course, see yellow-billed storks. We actually, at Pridelands, we used to see them often. We were so spoiled. We always had yellow-billed storks. Oh, there's another one. So there's three in total. Um, we won't worry about this. Oh, there we go. That's actually not so bad. Oh, my head's not really in the way, which is good. So there's another individual starting from this side of the dam. Ooh, some excitement must have felt something moving around there using its wings to help it balance gosh i don't know if i'd be able to move as quickly as these birds i'd slip and i'd get stuck and i'd fall over i wouldn't be a very good bird or i'd constantly have to have my wings open and above for for some sort of extra extra support well, there has to be something around there i imagine that there are a silly amount of frogs inhabiting this little water hole Barbel, catfish for sure, and who knows what else might be in those sort of murky waters. Maybe a couple of water scorpions. Lots and lots of invertebrates of all sorts of things. I've never seen a yellow-billed stork eating a terrapin before, but we know that terrapins aren't particularly tasty because they've got those stink glands and they secrete a foul-smelling substance uh, that takes a Sure, a good amount of washing and scrubbing with, you know, um, dishwashing liquid I normally try and use in, I feel like, normal hand soap. And kind of just, yeah, maybe it doesn't quite even mask the smell. It gives like a stinky, pleasant smell, which is not a vibe. So, yeah, using something that uh, that will really try to get that uh, grime off of your hands. But oh, it doesn't really work. It really doesn't. I wonder if, uh, you know, what truck drivers typically use or mechanics, there's that stuff with grit and it's normally pink in colour. 
I remember when my dad had a trucking business many, many years ago, we always used to have some of that at home. That would probably clean your hands pretty well because if you can get oil and all those other um, substances that mechanics have to handle or truck drivers have to handle, uh, then that would probably get the smell off. I reckon if we stick here for long enough, we should get a yellow built hornbill. Not a yellow built hornbill, that's goodness, right? That means I must go home. Good night, everybody, I'm leaving. Hey, can you imagine the things that I do, the things that I say? Whew, my credibility just went down the drain there. But anyways, you all know what I mean. Um, so we'll probably see them catching one. Okay, and they don't look like they're stopping. Just the... Uh, Plaxmouth lapwing watching, probably going peasants, because I'm sure that those birds think that they're superior. But these birds will use so many different fishing techniques. It's also interesting to watch and see what they're doing at that particular moment. It'll be virtually impossible for them to see anything in this murky brown water, so they really are just relying on the, the, the sort of little sensory nerves uh, in, along the beak to be able to assist them. Come on, get a frog. No, no luck, lost it. So it is gonna be on the difficult side for them. Oh, have you got something? I wonder if it's just waiting now for some more movement. It's sort of frozen, look at it. Barely moving. Oh, maybe as this other stalk walks towards it, it might encourage whatever that was. No, that didn't work. Now we're going to just peck the water. Peck, peck, peck. <laughs> That's an interesting technique. So birds seem to be a common thing today, but I don't have very many of them on my bingo bo uh, board. Ben is also doing a bit of birding. Let's see what feathered friend he's found. Right, we've got a, look, 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 a mobbing drongo. There we go, right on cue. Thank you very much, Mr. Drongo. There's a pale Wahlberg's eagle there getting harassed by a pair of drongos. And we do need mobbing drongos, if we can have that confirmed. Thank you very much. We've been sitting here for about five or six minutes and these drongos come in and then they do one or two mobs and then they disappear again. So that was perfect timing. Thank you, drongos. It's one of our pale morph Warburg's eagles. A shame, I do feel sorry for these things. They're just bombarded. They like to sit in these dead trees for a good view. Oh, look, there's more coming now. A mob of mongo... A uh, mongos. A, a mob of drongos mobbing. There we go. While we watch the Warburg's eagle getting mobbed, it's probably a good time to just remind everybody... Um, about our hangout with James Hendry, which is coming up uh, tomorrow at 8 o'clock Central African time. We know you've been really enjoying the Wild Show so far, I hope. Um, and if you've got lots of questions for James, he's going to be doing a hangout for Explorers Only, say, tomorrow at 8 o'clock. And so have a chat with him about how it's all going, and you can throw any questions at him. So don't miss out on that one. It's guaranteed to be entertaining. But you can clearly see that's a Wahlberg on the crest. Oh, that was a close call. That crest on the back of the head. You can see very diagnostic of our Wahlberg's eagles. We have lots around at the moment, and we're just sitting here, still close to Gary Dam. Keep getting waylaid on my way to Marips, but I assure you that'll be the next stop. Um, and we've had this pale morph in the area for a while. I think the other one of the pair is a little bit further away. We might just pick up its silhouette, but seems to be a standard dark morph. And I would therefore assume that the chances of these two... Um, producing a pale morph will be higher as that recessive gene. Ultimately what we're seeing there is a little bit of leucism, so a lack of melanin in the feathers. Shame it just gave its position away a little bit there by moving and that's upset the drongos again. Look at 
Please don't forget to confirm my mobbing drongos. It doesn't really help me again. I've got lots of stickers, but can't seem to make a line, which is a bit frustrating. Eddie, I think maybe let's do a board update because I'm confident that we're going to get confirmation uh, of those mobbing drongos. I think that one is, was fairly self-explanatory, I hope. So I hope I don't get to trouble for this, but I'm going to preemptively place my sticker on mobbing drongos just so you can see where we stand at the moment. So our hyenas did not cackle, which is a shame. And maybe Maribs leaps out of the tree whilst we're there. Or maybe we have a hyena present as well that makes a vague noise that I can spin into some sort of a cackle. No sign of our trotting warthog, which we've been looking for. And uh, no sign of any buffalo along with our cackling hyena. So we did grow. I think that's our tenth sticker, but struggling to make a line. All right, let's head in the direction of Maribs, I think and uh, see if he leaps anywhere, even if he doesn't. I'm just looking forward to seeing Maribs again. We, we had such an incredible sighting of him this morning. Uh, we stayed with him for oh, over a couple of hours. I was actually feeling a little guilty towards the end of it that we'd been with him for so long. But, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm sure he's used to it by now. It seems that we didn't get any confirmation of a scampering terrapin, apparently Terrapins, it seems, not able to scamper through the water. That was a shame. Otherwise, we've got three, four, six, seven, eight, nine stickers, or ten stickers. Four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got ten stickers. And we've had a non cackling hyena and a non scampering terrapin. Neither of those really help either. Well, the hyena would have been nice. Let's say, hopefully, those hyenas come a calling and uh, give us some action with Marips. Sorry, Chilo, I didn't copy that. Go again. Confirmation. Oh, confirmation of the Drongos. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, I did preemptively put that sticker on, which uh, was a little cheeky. That's fair enough. I'm still feeling a bit guilty about our Batalia, so uh, I'll, I'll accept the, the lack of confirmation for the other ones. <laughs> ben, I can only imagine how frustrated you must be having so many stickers but no line yet. But you're getting there. You are getting there. All of you are doing a brilliant job. And we are just taking it super easy here in Okokoyo. Our rhino has left and come back again and left again and come back again. I'm not sure what's happening with it. It's very, <laughs> very, very indecisive. But as I say, it's a little tricky with the actual sun rays on the water the glare that it creates makes it a little bit tricky but if you look closely or carefully i should say <laughs> the rhino is just to the beautiful glare on the water just to the right of it but as i say definitely looking for someone not sure if it's looking for someone that might have overstepped territory perhaps looking for female in estrus how incredible would that be? Oh my goodness. I would cry if we see mating rhinos here in Okokoyo. That would really be, be, be spectacular. You see, I'm even falling over my own words now. <laughs> Just thinking about how exciting that would be. What a sighting that would be. But we can only hope. Cross our fingers. I'm getting way ahead of myself now. I don't even know what this rhino was doing. Maybe it was just getting angry because of the other rhino that we had around. And I have also now a couple of times again attempted to try and show you the baby blacksmith lapwing. 
But of course, you know, then I find it and then we are not live. And then as soon as we go live, I've lost it again. So <laughs> we'll leave that one up to fate. If I'm meant to show you the baby blacksmith lapwings, then I definitely will have the opportunity to do so one of these beautiful, beautiful days in Okokoyo. Right. I saw some fresh buffalo dung at buffalo pan. So now I'm just trying to see if I can use the last remaining light if we can find the buffalo grazing. Right, so here I'm not going to get an ox packer. They'll be sleeping now or already perched where they're going to be roosting. I might still find a dancing zebra or a leaping leopard. That's always a possibility. We haven't had leopard for quite some days now. And it's not worrying, it's just how it goes. Leaping leopard, that's actually what would be how what we need to find, you know. What would a cat today be without cats? Well, for once the dogs hasn't found me. They were in fact seen, those same two dogs. Uh, I did drive the area. They... <coughs> Goodness, oh, it's grass season. Sorry, guys. It's going to be a lot of that. Anyway, so those dogs were seen. Thank you. Got a bit of a bless you from MC. Thanks. Kulu. Anyway, um, I, did, I did drive the area. I don't really want to spend too much time looking for the dogs. It's bingo day. We'll look for them tomorrow. Anyway, so you win some, you lose some. So today, not my best contribution. Uh, partially weather related. I'm not going to blame the weather. I love the weather when it rains. Because we need it. There's some elephant tracks. That's do we have another elephant on the, I don't think, oh, talking about rain, I can feel some drops. Uh, no, no more elephants. Yeah, no, definitely a drop or two, but we're still good. It's not, at the moment, it's, clouds are very high. I don't think we'll get rain now. Oh, I can feel it. Ooh. Some lightning to the east, but very, very far. Shouldn't affect us. That's 60 kilometers. Scott uh, is asking, which animal on my bingo card is the hardest to find? Um, I would say, I want to say observant owl. I haven't seen a lot of owls lately. It could be one of the easiest because I mean the, with those outlets I mean I, we used to see so many but now I don't it's probably just a bit of luck at the moment it's probably lions because there's no indication of any lions on Pridelands at the moment there's no tracks we don't know if they're on the property are they north are they east where they are so currently probably but when they're here they could be the easiest if I have to Choose one animal here is wallowing warthog. The reason being they're very common. There's a lot of warthog out here. But the warthogs in this area are very nervous. They are very difficult to frame up on camera. So from that perspective, I would say wallowing warthog is probably the most difficult. And then to a certain degree, monkeys. Because we don't have a lot of monkeys. We don't have big drainage lines with big riverine areas adjacent to it um, so habitat for the monkeys are well there's some tracks of the dogs as well going that way by the way or one dog at least so those two are the trickiest it's not that they're not here it's just tricky to frame them
I can hear some guinea fowl vocalizing quite profusely there. Let's go and take a look if there's not something for us. I'm gonna have to get my torch out. Let's see if it's oh, some buffalo tracks on the road. Oh, buffalo dung. Something's bothering those guinea fowl there. Right, I reckon it's time to to get some illumination. Let me take a second. I've got my torch right here. My spotlight. Okay. What's making you guys scream there, Impala? Guinea fowls? I mean, just their normal evening sort of chorus. I'm gonna switch this off for now. It's still not, not yet dark enough to really use the spotlight. Copy and let's see if we can't get our leaping leopard there. <clears throat> right, I would like to know if Ben's also looking for a leaping leopard. Let's go and find out. Uh, yes, Chris, I am looking for a leaped le leaping leopard, but what we have found is a very sleepy leopard sleeping very high up in a marula tree surrounded by foliage, which has made it rather difficult for us to get a spot to show you. But you can clearly see there is Marips uh, lying on a branch. He's very high up in the marula tree. His dacre kill is still sort of in the fork of the tree, so I'm hoping at some point he's going to come down a little bit and that will give us a better visual. Uh, but he is still safe. We do have so a half-eaten dacre, there's not very much of it left now in the fork of the tree. Let's see if we can show you that. So just down there, left of screen. So there is a bit of dacre hanging over the branch there. If you come down a bit more, you'll see the leg, I think. Yes, yeah, so see there's a leg hanging down, so there really isn't much left, just a bit of sort of skin, bone and sinew, really. Doesn't look to be much meat on it. Uh, and we also do have a hyena lying underneath the tree, as ever. It might be a little bit behind the bush from where we've had to uh, park up. But there we go. I'm assuming that this is Gingrika, because she has been hanging around uh, this morning. And I think she knows that there's potentially something to be had here. And it'll be interesting to see whether June and Comet head into this area as well. But everybody is, seems to be taking a moment. A very sleepy leopard and a very sleepy hyena. We are, of course, hoping that Gingrika wakes up and cackles for us. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I have to say, the majority of the fire has come from Odie. He's uh, exhibited a competitive streak that I wasn't aware existed this afternoon, but I like that. There's nothing wrong with a bit of healthy competition. Uh, however, it may all be in vain, because it seems that the rules here, if no one wins or no one gets five in a row, um, it's declared null and void, which would be frustrating, having had so many stickers on our board this afternoon. But alas... Uh, we've had lots of content, or content, or lots of things that we have seen and been able to show you, which is the main thing. And perhaps if we're lucky, so Marips will leap down the tree towards his kill and begin feeding. And if we did get a leaping leopard and Gingrika was to cackle, perhaps amused by his uh, aerial or arboreal antics, then we will 
win a resounding victory. I suppose we could try telling some, some jokes to Gingrika. If anybody knows any hyena jokes, feel free to fling them my way. I mean, to be honest, I'm so hungry right now, I could boil a hyena, but I'd only make a laugh, but I'd only make myself a laughing stock. Oh, a, a mild laughter from Owen at the back, and Gingrika didn't move. I don't think uh, she appreciated that one. Well, at least it made Julie laugh in uh, <laughs> on the radio. <laughs> I'm going to make a combination of the thorns and the bark. That's what I'm going to do. It's basically just a very big open system. But aren't they pretty? Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning. Afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome again to another afternoon here in Amakala Game Reserve. And uh, as you can see, the clouds are pretty dramatic still after quite a massive storm that we've had for the most part of the day today. But things are sure looking green out there, aren't they? So, hello again. My name is still Andrew and I have Mr. BK with me behind camera. We're pretty excited to be heading out. It's our first time heading out today, but definitely we are chuffed to, to be out here. So we started off with a lovely landscape out here, out here by Buzzard's View, and uh, just trying to make the most of what time we have left for the afternoon. Lovely. I hope this has passed over. It does seem like it's going to come back tonight. We'll just see what uh, what happens there. Not sure how much rain we had in the, the whole course of the day. I should imagine it's been close to 20 millimeters. Now all the roads are pretty much uh, waterlogged and all those clay roads are now wet. So we are quite limited. We need to sort of stick to the roads that we know we're not going to get stuck on. <laughs>
Rose Candy, thanks for that comment. Yeah, better late than never. That is very, very true. And a good way to come out this afternoon is with this beautiful landscape over here. It's one of my favorite areas. I've got several. Uh, we're not too far from God's Window, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, this one we're at is called Buzzard's View, which is equally as beautiful, overlooking this entire basin area. And what you're seeing now is the entire game reserve. Have a look at that. And there's more. This is just the basin section. Now we have uh, quite a wide variety of different areas here. We have the basin section, then we have the top section, we have the northern sections, and then the far western section as well. So of course with the, the reserve, it's not a perfect square, so it is. Uh, it does run at different angles. All right, we're going to send you over to Taylor. I believe she's got some smaller uh, characters of the bush. Well, finally, we have found something that could potentially go onto the bingo board. It is a red toad. Now I know it doesn't really look like much because it has flattened itself so much down uh, onto the ground. Um, but you, maybe we'll try and reposition a little bit closer so you can kind of get a better look at it right now. There you can see a little bit of, move, of movement. Um, but good place to, of course, look for frogs. You can hear all the bubbling casinas, I'm sure, in between my, uh, the, my sentences. And they're notoriously hard to find but sometimes the toads will come out onto the road in search i mean frogs as well in search of insects and that type of thing so that's might what that's probably what's happening or perhaps the sand is even a little bit warm still let me go a bit for, closer just so you can actually get something i don't know if it's gonna jump again how's that can you see it we're going to try. There it is. Up a bit. There. There we go. Now we should be able to get a, a better view of it. Is it. Can we go any closer than that? Is that it? Is that maximum? Okay, I'm going to try to go even closer because I'm actually trying to show you why it's called a red toad, but this really is not helping, unfortunately. That's not... Uh, I could have told you that that would, is an African bullfrog or a uh, shovel nose frog. Okay, I'm just trying to see what our limit is. Can we see it now? I didn't go too much further forward. So I'm just sort of putting it... Let's see. Uh, sort of, a little bit better. Anyways, now you can actually see it breathing. Anyways, <laughs> it is a red back toad, and, um, or a red toad, and the, the back part of the frog is a lovely sort of rusty red color. It's not, not like red like lipstick kind of kind of thing. Um, but they are quite pretty frogs. They don't get very big, maybe just over 10 centimeters or so. So a third of the length of a ruler, probably a bit longer than that. And then they've got quite a light underbelly and you can see on, on the sides of their bodies, they've got this sort of black stripe that runs all the, the way down. And normally where I have found red toads is actually in rhino middens. Now, when it's not breeding season and not the rainy season, um, for the most part, they will be conserving their energy because, of course, as you know, in the winter months, it can be a little bit on the chilly side, but the insect activity is relatively low. So they'll find a little burrow for themselves, whether it's in the crevices of rocks or a hollow of a tree. They're actually quite good climbers, the uh, the red toads, um, but like I said, I've actually found them in little hollows in, in um, rhino middens before, which is so fascinating. I suppose that's a good place to be, and potentially you're going to find a meal quite close by because dung obviously attracts a host of insects, and that's mainly what they're going to be feeding on. So 
I mean, I have got a fidgety frog. It is fidgeting, I mean, a little bit. So you're going to have to tell me if this counts or not. Every now and then it sits up, it goes down. Um, it's not fidgeting too much. And I mean, you can see, obviously, in, in my headlights, you can see a couple of little bugs being attracted to the light. But this frog doesn't seem to be too interested. Not that I'm trying to coax any insects into this area. I just wanted you to have a good look. But I think I'll probably just move the light off just a little bit. There we go. Now it's just in the head lights but plenty of uh, bugs around this evening it's sort of quite muggy um, you know not quite not too humid but it's not cool either it's something in between so I suppose muggy is a good word to describe it I unfortunately don't have the frog calls on my phone anymore because it would have been nice to have maybe played it softly just so that you can hear what they sound like and now you're in the road and I don't want to squash you. Are you going to move off the road so we can carry on? Because that, that would be ideal if we're able to do that. You hear the bubbling casinos. I definitely have to brush up on my frog calls actually. Right, so we're going to wait for uh, the verdict, whether this does count as a fidgeting frog. I think I'm taking a little bit of a chance, yeah? <laughs> but at least it's an actual frog this time. Um, and off I'm going to send you to Chris, who's also bumbling around in the dark. Well, I've managed to find a frog of my own. And I need a frog. I need a fidgety frog. I can't really see what it is. It, it, it's looking at those pronounced eyes, raised eyes. It looks like a grey tree frog or a foamless frog. But he doesn't look uneasy or restless, which is basically the meaning of fidgety. I don't know. Does he look restless to you? And there's a millipede as well. Maybe that will make him a bit uneasy or restless. Well, it's a frog. It's probably the only frog I'm going to see. But while we're on frogs, listen to this beautiful sound. Those are the bubbling casinas. So they stay out in the bush, under grasses, under bushes during daytime. And at night, they start calling and they slowly, slowly move closer to the water. It's one of the prettiest frogs. In fact, it's beautiful. Kind of like yellow and black markings. It's in fact aposematic markings. It's slightly toxic. So I'm not sure if I can claim that as a fidgety frog, though. The bubbling casinos are definitely quite fidgety. You can see they're very restless, making a lot of noise. Well, I've got a confirmation that it, the viewers think it is, in fact, a fidgety frog. So this will be number... Let's figure out. It'll be number four for me for today. But I'll still be on two. I'll definitely still be on two. Let's grab a sticker here. Thank you very much, everybody. That is so much appreciated. The fidgety frog.
Well, we're going to continue and see what we can scratch out. Maybe we can get our leaping leopard before the end of show. Well, Ben's found a leopard. Let's go see what Marips is up to. Well, good luck, Chris. Our, our leopard doesn't look as if it's going to be leaping anywhere, it has to be said. Marips has, we've managed to finally work a position where we can see him nicely with the IR light. Uh, but I cannot believe that is a comfortable position. You can see how heavy his tummy is. It's just sort of sagging in between his front and back legs. And if you're struggling to make out exactly how he's lying, because it is just sort of a blur of rosettes, that's his face on the left and his nose sort of pointing up to the top left-hand corner of the screen. He's got it, his sort of left cheek resting on that branch, but he's got his neck twisted and torqued more than 90 degrees from his spine. Um, but only, only a leopard could find that comfortable, I suppose. But we have at least managed to work... Ah, oh, there we go. Maybe it was just a bit too uncomfortable. Look at that dummy sticking out. But the killer is below him, so if he was to decide that he wants a bit more food, then he may well indeed leap down. Brian, thank you for the question. Uh, the chances are, are not great, uh, to be honest. Uh, he may look, <laughs> unless he falls asleep and just rolls over the edge. <laughs> um, they are surprisingly good at staying in a tree. Although, so he's really struggling to get comfortable there. He may move shortly. Um, the only time I've ever seen a leopard sort of fall out of a tree was in panic, because I saw one uh, trying to move his impala kill into a better position. Oh, shame. Um, and he, he kind of dropped it, and there was a hyena underneath, and he was in such a panic, he tried to catch it in his mouth uh, as he dropped it, and kind of gracefully tumbled out of the tree in the process, landed on his feet, as you would expect from a cat. Uh, but they seem to have this incredible ability to balance their body weight and get their centre of gravity in the right place. Um, it probably has happened, Brian, but I've, I've never seen it, and it's the sort of thing that we you know, would have done the rounds on social media if somebody had captured a, an image of that. So, despite the fact that he may look incredibly uncomfortable up there, he's, uh, he knows what he's doing and he has managed to find himself a position where at least he feels stable. I think his stomach is weighing him down so much that uh, he should be fairly well wedged in there. But thank you, Brian, for the question. We do enjoy our younger viewers' questions. Maybe he falls out of the tree, which would be some very entertaining footage, I'm sure. But let's just hope he's OK if he does. As expected, he's found what looks to be a slightly more comfortable position now, but you can see he's sort of nodding off the whole time. <coughs> Excuse me. I do like the way he's got his arms draped over that branch, a bit like hugging the pillow next to you. I wonder how long he's going to continue doing this before he decides maybe this is not the place. His head keeps slipping. Uh, points for perseverance. <laughs> Tossing and turning. <laughs> right, let's try this. He's having a glance at Kangrika. Yes, the hyena is still there. Not laughing yet, or cackling. <laughs> yes, Brian only just suggested that, uh, oh, is he going to leap? Is he going to leap? Uh, should he fall out of the tree? I'm sure Gagrika will cackle at that. That's the, the hyena lying under the tree at the moment. Oh, oh, oh. 
Come on, leap. I think he's probably just going to move to a slightly more comfortable spot. Just keeping an eye on that hyena. Debating what to do next, I think. We are doing some serious frogging this evening. I'm honestly not 100% certain of my ID here. I think it is a African bullfrog, it looks like it maybe a female or a juvenile but it's quite hard to sort of tell there's actually two of them there's another one just sitting just to the left it might be a bit camouflaged there we go you can just sort of see its little head poking out there that look more like a gecko than anything but we'll have a look at the other one because you can see it a bit better but there's a couple of them so um the only other thing that i could think of but to be honest i don't think i've ever seen one before is an ornate frog but I don't think so. Uh, I, I suspect that this is a yeah either a juvenile or a female African bullfrog. But if there are any amphibian specialists watching this evening, please let me know. I am very rusty on uh, on frogs and toads. Uh, I absolutely love them, and they've always been a complete passion of mine. But I, I must be honest, over the last year, I haven't spent much time focusing them and, and, and amphibians have definitely taken a back seat and the bugs have really taken over. Which makes me sad because I'm very passionate about these, uh, about these creatures. But there are also lots of allates that have been released, the reproductive uh, termites, and there's also reproductive ants that are out and flying about. Uh, so that makes me think that's why there are so many um, frogs and toads around this evening there's just plenty of food available for them you can see even with the toad i'm not putting the light on um, you know it'll first see it'll blow the frog you know out in terms of its coloration but you know we have to be very respectful with spotlight so the center of the beam is not on it and i'm just putting a little bit of light on oh, okay wait we have to we have to show them something the gecko is on the dashboard are you ready before i light it up um do you see sorry you're going to see darkness Hi. Do you see it there? It's a slithering lizard or a lizard a slithering. Not quite, but I mean, it's close enough, surely. You can just see its tail at the moment. It was actually in the rain covers, um, which was, was quite funny. It was obviously sheltering itself there. Let me just try and bring the light around a bit. There we go. That's a little bit better. Sorry, little one. I don't want to disturb you. You've got really big eyes. Again, like I said, we must be sensitive to all creatures. I'm also just trying to see which gecko it is. I wonder if it's a Marais tropical house gecko or a bronze. I'm not really sure, but it's a youngster. It's not a very big one just yet. Um, it's most certainly still a juvenile. So sadly, I think we disturbed it when we put the rain roof on because they sit in storage most of the time and the flaps that are rolled up create it like a little cave. I mean, I've had a spotted bush snake come out of the uh, rain covers before while I was driving, which gave me a big fright until I realized what it is. So it does not surprise me uh, that a gecko has found its, its way um, into the, the rain covers. And now it's just accompanying us. Please eat every one of these flying creatures because they're going down my shirt and I don't like it very much. Not even a little bit, sorry. There we go. Let me just do that again. Ooh, very quick. Look, there's a little bug, eat it. Again, I'm not trying to encourage everybody, but we've got all the lights on the vehicle as we're driving around. And naturally that is going to coax um, little creatures to this area. You're also breathing quite quickly. Are you? Is it quick or is it normal? I don't know the respiration rate of, <laughs> of reptiles, to be honest. I don't think I've read about that before. Maybe it'll be opportunistic and catch one of these um, flying creatures. It looks like there's like some, I don't even know what that thing is in front of it. I have no idea. But I'm not going to go and investigate because I don't want to scare the little critters. So I know that we managed to get the fidgety frog, which was quite cool. So thank you for confirming that. And hopefully we get a second one now, a lizard a slithering. Oh, 
It is going to catch it. Oh, it grabbed it. Hi, I've got one down my shirt now, so I'm going to try and not move the light too much. Was that just delicious? Was that the tastiest treat ever? I don't think you're going to be able to eat too many of them. You're not very big at all. Yum. And that's exactly what's going to happen um, is, I mean, quite often you'll, uh, quite often you will, f uh, f what am I trying to say now? You'll find like a lot of reptiles and even hyenas and things at the entrance of where these allates are being released at the termite mounds or um, the ant mounds. And, and then they'll just sort of you know, guzzle them down right there. Otherwise, if you're at a lodge and there are any light path, you know, lights along the pathway, it's quite entertaining. I've had many great sightings, not necessarily of geckos, but of bushveld rain frogs just sitting there and gobbling everything up. Um, however, lights are not particularly good. Um, again, just because there are, you know, insects and that type of thing, uh, we tend to blow them off. Like, ah, oh, you know, they're not that important where are you i did sorry chulu can you repeat that again you need to go off the car you're going to come into my hand so i can put you down on the ground i don't like to pick things up please i don't want you to lose your tail because they do lose their tail oh okay wonderful so we'll let that lizard do its thing let's have a look at the bingo board very quickly so i'm going to try and place the light here because we have got two more to add which is great because doesn't that take us up to seven so we've got a slithering lizard, whoop whoop. Sadly, I don't think we're gonna get an actual bingo. And we have uh, another fidgety frog. Oh gosh, well, well stuck, Taylor. You can see I did a great job when I was younger at school. How many have you got? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, that's not too bad, I don't think, for my first go. I'm pretty chuffed with that. Now, right, let's carry on because let's see if we can get a chameleon. I'll be really, really happy if we can find a chameleon this evening. We have uh, been trying quite hard, so we'll continue the search. Are coming. Jason, while I'm being cinematic. <laughs> From the sublime to the ridiculous, everybody, of that ethereal and unattainable thing, the happy marriage. Be nice to see him. <laughs> this is an unbelievable afternoon.
There's a bundle of rosettes up there. You can see the tail hanging down on the right-hand side. But uh, just watching just right at the bottom of the screen, you could see that um, leg just dangling at the bottom of the screen there. I'm sure he's just feeding on what little bit of flesh is still left on the other side of that branch. But you can see how much foliage there is behind him from our perspective so we went around that side i don't think we're going to see anything at all so we'll just exercise a little bit of patience and hopefully he'll manipulate uh, the kill there or at least pop his head around the other side of this branch maybe feed on the the shoulder area perhaps i don't think he's going to be here tomorrow there really isn't very much left of this day canal he may spend the evening in the tree, you never know, and just busy digesting, so there's a chance. But I certainly don't think he's going to hang around for much longer. He has pretty much dismantled this second acre now. He's been here for a couple of days. check with my spotlight again in case there's any sign of Gingrika. We haven't heard a cackle yet. She didn't appreciate my previous hyena joke. I do have one more in the bag. If we see her, I might try it. Bob Champion, you're in Sweden. It's awesome to hear from some of our Scandinavian viewers as well. Uh, yes, he is Full of antics, as always, is our ribs. And so, so whilst you were, uh, I think you were with Taylor, he did decide that that uh, perch that he'd found himself previously was just not the spot. As you could see, his head kept slipping off. So I guess he's decided, well, if I can't sleep, I might as well eat. And he uh, hopped down the branch as he leapt up here, grabbed his dacre and has taken it higher up into the tree having a bit of a evening meal. But so it was an amazing sighting of him this morning. Uh, so especially when he took it down out of the tree because he got a bit hot and then he almost lost it to Gingrika. He had to shoot up a tiny little quarry bush that I'm amazed actually supported his weight. And Gingrika was trying to climb up there after him as well, but unfortunately she just doesn't, <laughs> she did not have the ability uh, but she got so close, I actually felt sorry for her. Probably only about 30 centimetres away from the Daker. Oh, we're going to get some movement. Come on, come on. Oh, there's a chin. Well, we are nearly out of time, unfortunately. It's been a... A good afternoon of bingo, but, oh, you're coming to me, okay. Uh, a good afternoon of bingo, but as you can see, we did really well. We got 10 stickers, but could not manage to find a line. Leaping Leopard, Cackling Hyena, I have both of these here, but they didn't perform the way we wanted them to. But alas, it's been a great afternoon, and well done to my fellow competitors, so I suppose that's going to be null and void now. Uh, but yes, we very much hope you've enjoyed the drive. And uh, we, of course, will be out tomorrow morning, as always, from 5.30 Central African time. And we very much hope that you will be able to join us. And we will certainly come and see if Marips is still around. Maybe those black dam males are still hanging around in Treehouse Dam. But it's been a beautiful afternoon in the African bush, as always. Uh, great to hear from people in Sweden and locally in Johannesburg and wherever else you may be. But have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. And we'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning for another Sunrise Safari. Episode of the Wild Show. We will enjoy.